No, I think I stopped it by accident. Okay. Pursuant to Massachusetts General Laws, Chapter 38, uh, paragraphs 18 through 25, as amended by Chapter 28 of the Acts 2009, the Wetlands Protection Act, and the Well Fleet Environmental Protection Bylaw of July 1986, and its regulation of January 2000, the Well Fleet Conservation Commission will hold public hearings Wednesday, March 26, 2022, at 5 p.m. 4 p.m., we will have the business meeting, which is what we're going to do right now. So we are now in attendance. Uh, currently from the commission, we have Barbara Brennesel, Michael Fisher, and Benjamin Fairbank, and myself, Leon Streets. My understanding is uh, that we have a discussion about NRAB's pond project. Yep, and John Real can't be with us tonight, but we have Herb Gasalder and Laura Hewitt here um, okay. to present to present on NRAB's behalf. And John Real wishes he could be here, but he can't. Okay, so who's going to take the lead? Who wants to go first? Or you or me? You want to start it off? Um, go ahead, Herb. <laughs> <laughs> we are in the early stages of. This is the NREB developing a ponds management plan. The last plan was done in 2011. And so it's obviously time to do another one. What we'd like to bring, go over with you today is just an idea of what we envision as the goals of the plan and where we are now in the planning process. And uh, we, have a long way to go, but we thought it'd be good to start early with you and let you know what our thinking is and what direction we're going. Or do you want to go to the, the goal of the, of the plan? Sure. Um, and the only thing that I'd, that I'd add to that description is that when we as an NRIB group did the last plan in 2011, they were general recommendations and we're hoping to make this plan just a little more measurable and um, and looking to you all for guidance. So our, our general goal of the plan um, is to maintain the natural health of the well fleet ponds for maybe a 10 year horizon. Um, in other words, we're looking not to accelerate the natural eutrophication process over the 10 year period and ensure that uh, the, peer, the process be as natural as possible with minimal human impact. Um, beyond that, we've, we've begun to put together some, some steps and thoughts of how we might uh, figure out where we are today. And Herb, do you want to walk through those or? Sure, sure, I'd be happy to. The original, we've kind of naive starting off. The original goal we said was to maintain the ponds in their current condition. And then Joanne, Joanne Muramato has been very helpful to us along the way pointed out that eutrophication is a natural process, that the good, rational goal has to be to make sure we don't in any way or try not to accelerate the eutrophication process. But, uh, and we certainly, it's beyond our scope to try and reverse anything in the plan. The, uh, we're, we're in, in terms of what is covered by the plan, we're, We've, we're focusing on eight ponds, which is um, duck, dire, great, long, gull, Higgins, Williams, and herring ponds. Basically all the ponds that have, have uh, access. I think the only small pond that has official access otherwise is Spectacle Pond, but we're focusing on, on those eight ponds. Um, and I know some of you know, I, I was involved in the Gull Pond Area Conservation Association for 30 years or more, Gupaka. And one of my frustrations in working with Gupaka was ever getting a consensus of what the health of a pond is. Is the pond healthy? Is the pond deteriorating? So. We believe that the first step in making a pond management program is to start with a baseline description of the health of each of those ponds. 
Um, and what we're work, one of the things we're working on now is defining what are the criteria that describe the health of a pond at the moment. We had a, a good and productive session with Joanne Muramato on this. And I have, we have a session scheduled with Sophia Fox for next week. But again, this is preliminary. But ideally what we'd like to do is establish, is do a baseline test in those eight ponds for chlorophyll, total phosphate, clarity, the water temperature, dissolved oxygen, pH, conductivity, and cyanobacteria. We think it'd be wonderful if for those eight ponds, we could say on day one of the plan, these are the measurements. What about nitrates, Herb? Um, nitrates probably should be added. What we've found somewhat to our surprise is that the, um, the I'm sorry. Um, nitrate, the, 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 the determining element in fresh water seems to be phosphates. This is what we're hearing. Nitrates for salt water and phosphates for um, fresh water. Now we can add nitrates, but what we're trying to do is shrink that list rather than add it. But if, if, if especially if this, if this commission were to feel that we should have, be testing nitrates in that initial list, Nitrates will be in that initial list. I think it might be important in the future. It's not the limiting factor in ponds, like you said, but but I've had um, a couple of lengthy discussions with Sophia about it, and um, she clearly is a water quality expert, and she felt it was important to um, to talk about that and think about the nitrogen reducing systems, even when they're within um, 100 feet of ponds, so fresh water. So, I think there is some important information we can glean from that. So I would just add it. Okay, we'll be added. It sounds, it sounds like you're uh, primarily interested in the quality of the water itself, but the health of a pond would also be the flora and fauna of a pond and maybe uh, in, environment for th things like pine trees that have fallen into the water and stuff that provide uh, sanctuary for fry and frogs and things like that. I, I'm just wondering, are you focusing strictly on the chemistry of the water, or the health of the water? No, it's a good question. I mean, that when I talk about the health of the water, of course, we're talking about what would cause rapid plant growth in the water. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I should have specified that. It's not just the, the, the nice appearance or smell of the water. It's, it's what is going to cause accelerated plant growth. Mm -hmm. But one of the questions we have that we haven't decided on yet is how much do we address vegetation problems? There is a problem in some of the ponds with Phragmites, uh, specifically in uh, Williams and now encroaching in Gull Pond. Mm -hmm. And Phragmites is, is a very powerful invasive plant. Mm -hmm. uh, I know Stephen Smith has been doing some work on that. But this is an open question, and we again welcome your input on how much of an emphasis you think we should have on controlling vegetation such as Phragmites and other invasive plants. I think it's worth documenting. I think we'd end up in like World War Seven uh, with some town committees and townspeople on the actual control methodology. Yes. Um, and the removal plan, but I think that's something we're going to have to face into the future. Um, so if we tee it up now, I think it's worth it's worth starting the discussion, but but it's not going to be pretty. No, what, what Hillary is of course referring to is the treatment for Phragmites is um, glyphosate Roundup. Mm. We've already had it within 
from Parker. We've had some very heated discussion. Yeah. Today. But but that's why I think we 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 tee it up and then we 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 see how we can get from point A to point B. But we have to acknowledge that it is an issue. Yes. Yeah. With things like the number of floats in the water, the part of your report, do you think? The number of floats or docks. Hmm. Yeah. Am I not coming through clearly? Yeah. No, we'll add all those. Yeah. I mean, as, as Herb said, our inclination was to start with the baseline of the water quality and then go from there into a variety of things that impact the pond, um, including the area around it, what's in it, the septics bringing groundwater to it. Uh, right. Yeah, the, uh, the chemistry will give you a sign that something happening something bad is happening but then you'll have to you know to fix it you'll have, we'll need to go out and uh, find it find we, out. Are, we are being told that um, the vast amount of nutrients coming into the pond comes in through groundwater which then points right back to septic systems which then one of our thoughts in writing a plan with a 10-year viewpoint is the hope that during this 10-year period, there really will be significant improvement in septic systems, including the ability to filter out phosphates. Mm -hmm. And nitrates, yeah. And nitrates so, together. And, yeah. and you know, there is new technology out there looking at the phosphate removal, but and there's grant money also available through Bonstable County if folks want to, you know, test out one of the phosphate removing technologies, but they're still so new. Yes. But one of the things we want to do is talk to the, I don't I remember the gentleman's name now. The man at Barnstaple County who's running. Yeah, the, yep. Is it Brian? It's Brian uh, Baumgartel, but actually Trace, uh, Emily, wait a minute, she's got two first names. <laughs> Michelle, well, I can't think of her two first names right now, but she um, is, so Emily Michelle, I think it's her two first names. Emily Michelle. Emily Michelle is um, the one heading up the phosphate study and she's given two presentations recently um, at two different conferences I've been at. So you might, and I can reach out to her if you want, have her come and talk to the committee because it is fascinating to see what's coming down the pipe. So that just food for thought for one of your future meetings. No, that's, that's on the list. That, that would be terrific if you could reach out to her. Yeah, absolutely. Um, one, one of the um, areas that we know little about that we're hoping to get input from you on is regulatory authority over the ponds. <laughs> and this, I think, comes squarely in, into your area. We don't know what regulatory authority, Conservation Commission town has over the ponds and how that relates to the National Seashore regulatory of the ponds. Could you help us with that at all? So that's kind of interesting. Um, the regulatory authority is tricky because um, it depends on the location and the size of the pond. Um, the Conservation Commission has authority over the pond by way of the Re Wetlands Protection Act and the Wellfleet Environmental Protection Bylaws. So I guess um, as long as it's a town landing that leads to the pond, we have some jurisdiction. On the landing or that leads into jurisdiction on the pond? Well, it leads into jurisdiction on the pond, but it's it's dicey because I know that the National Park um, 
does some things on the pond. So, so I, I think it's not actually a hundred percent clear. Isn't there the issue about the bottom, the water, and then the shore as yep. three different factors. And again, depending on where it is and the size, different agencies have different ownership about a responsibility for each of those three things. If we're, if we're you're all, if these you're are all great ponds that we're interested in. They're right. all above if, each acres. If you're meeting with Sophia next week, maybe she can put you in contact with Lauren McKean, who's their yeah. natural resource person who might at least give you some direction because we're confused too. We, we get a lot of issues and we're not sure uh, mm. if we have jurisdiction over that particular thing or not. So it would be very good for all of us to clear that up. And I think the Harbor Master also has some authority yeah. over floats or floating docks. Yes. Mm -hmm. yes. Barbara, you and I met with Lauren last year. Right. That was about the kayaks, but yes. she might be able to shed some more light about uh, jurisdictional issues. Good. That that would be helpful. Because you know we're looking at a 10-year period where right. there may have to be regulate uh, some attempt at least to put regulations in of, of having people change some of what they're doing. Yeah. I don't know if you're interested in biodiversity too as a metric um, following so that. Um, uh, but if you know someone who um, is working with environmental DNA, all you need to do is collect some water samples and put them in the freezer and then compare them to those water samples over the year, like take samples every year. And you can use the DNA in ponds to get a really good sense of what plants and animals are there, the timing of year that they're there, depending on when and where you collect them. Um, it's a hot new area in ecology and environmental science. And um, it doesn't hurt if someone has a freezer to store some water samples to uh, keep them for now and then follow up later. And Sophia might be able to help you. She might know some people who are doing environmental DNA work um, in freshwater and other uh, aquatic habitats. If you're doing it that way, you could uh, you could do all the processing at once with the same same uh, technology, rather than having the the values change over the ten years because the technology that you're using for the testing is changing, right? Hmm. This is good. This is this is good. One of the things we wanted to do on our on our to do list is reach out to the other towns in the area and understand at least in our area and understand what they're doing. We know East Ham. We understand test eight to ten ponds, but I don't know for what. And Orleans does some through the Orleans Pond Coalition. Yeah. Um, it seems that. Harwich also has a, a town sponsored program. I'm going to reach out and <coughs> see what they're doing, what we can learn from them. Um, yes. Um, have you checked with the APCC? Because they've got a pond project on the Cape. Yeah, we had a, a Joanne Muramato has, has been very helpful to us. We had a, a, a couple hour meeting with her. On, on Zoom and basically developed the list I gave you of what we should test for basically came from Joanne. She also gave us leads on, on labs, um, but, but they've been they've been very helpful to us in any way they can. I think it's important work. I'm glad someone's started this. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's going so to take Joanne, will Joanne lend herself to evaluating the data or Sophia? Um... Good question. I, I, I can't speak for Joanne, but she has emphasized that whatever we would need from her, we should call on her. Okay. Um, and is your data going to, because those the seashore takes their own data. We're not duplicating efforts, correct? 
Well, that's that's one reason I'm I'm meeting Sophia. Next okay, week. perfect, perfect. I'm going to be in Wealthy. I, I, you probably know she's my next door neighbor. Oh, so, good. Okay, so so you guys can talk about that. Just we're because we have a back porch meeting. And, uh, perfect. <laughs> hopefully, because I think Sophia is always willing to share her data. Um, I don't know if she can always give us a hard copy report, but she's always willing to share her findings. So I guess it depends on what we're going to need looking to the future. They have an intern this year who's reviewing all the data. <coughs> they wanted, they were concerned they might have some inaccuracy. She told me already that they will, uh, by the end of this year, they expect to have a clean database. Good. Great. And in the past, I've gotten data dumps from them. For Perfect. The topic. They're, they're Great. Good. Or what else should we? Uh, um, does, it, does it sound like we're on the right track? And are you all, how would we involve uh, the CONSCOM in the future, I guess, was one of our questions, too. Uh, I think, or do you want us to just come back and talk to you periodically about what we are with you? Well, uh, it strikes me that what you're doing is uh, is setting a baseline and then continuing on so that we can see when something is changing. Yes. But the remediation for that probably is outside. It's in some other already existing, like the health department for uh, mm. for uh, sewage systems or, or for uh, various uh, Title V, et cetera. Um, but, and as far as traffic or, or any other kind of, there's, there should be things, uh, processes or at least responsibilities already established, right? What you think? To, to fix a problem that your work will determine uh, I think that looking at it beyond what the seashore may be looking at, it, which they're probably doing the same kind of statistical analysis, they're looking at the whole case, but um, or at least the upper lower case. But it seems that the holistic uh, health of a pond and what the interactions are and understanding the ecology that holds it all together is something that. Uh, goes beyond or above what's already being done by the uh, seashore, I would think. What do you think, Barbara? Um, I, I think um, the seashore has been trying to monitor. I, I'm a friend of Sophia too, and I know Steve Smith, but you know, sometimes they don't have a budget. Uh, <laughs> sometimes the sampling's not consistent. So I think having some consistent sampling and, and knowing what questions you're asking before um, might be helpful. But I think baseline data is, is always important. The question about who deals with it really depends on the jurisdictional issues that Herb's asking about mm -hmm. because um, it depends on who's responsible. Is it a state issue? Is it uh, the bottom lands? Is it the water column? Um, so that gets more complicated. Who, who deals with the, if there is a problem, who deals with it? But I think it, it's, it's time. Uh, the ponds across the Cape are falling into this um, perilous situation with increased har harmful algal blooms, warmer temperatures, a lot of changes in the types of organisms that are there and the time of year that they're there. So um, it, it's a good time to really start this because I think we can anticipate some changes in the next decade. Mm -hmm. Unfortunately, I, yeah. I, have, I have a question probably for Hillary. Um, is, uh, is there any mapping going on that shows where these new enhanced systems are being installed in the ground versus <laughs> no? Because that, that would be interesting. Yeah, we haven't actually installed any enhanced IA systems. Oh, okay. um, and we don't have a map of where the I actually, yes, the county database, I think 
Well, I think we could work with the county, with um, the test center folks and the Cape Cod Commission to get an updated map of where all of our IA systems are. I don't think that would be very difficult because they both, um, they operate on the same systems. So I think we could get that. And you have maps of where all the cesspools are around the, the pond? Well, we don't have maps where the cesspools are, but um, we currently have out all of our files within the seashore and all of our ponds fall within the seashore. Um, so we will know when we're done this exercise for the attorneys um, where exactly the cesspools are. We haven't updated it. We haven't updated our information in a while, but I know I've worked with Gupaka um, in the past and pulled all the files around Goal and Higgins to see what's going on there. And we've looked at Long also. So um, we, have, we have information, yes. As far as the IA systems goes, so as I understand it, so far, most of the work that's been done and the systems that are in place focus on removing nitrates. That's correct. It doesn't do phosphates. Right. All so right. that's in terms of the ponds, that's really not going to do that much for right. us now. That's, that's, we're hoping that over this 10 year period, they will develop more, comp more effective systems for phosphates and systems that are easier to use too. Yeah. And as, I as I understand it, distance matters with phosphates. I mean, the further the septic system is from the pond, the less the phosphates get through. Is that not true? Well, the longer it takes them to get there. Yes. Yeah, I thought they some of them were were fixed or absorbed or break down over the journey. Not much. Hmm. I've always heard that just that they travel much slower. But they, but they know, get there. But they, yeah, but they get there. That's going to make it hard to do metrics if you put in advanced systems, but it takes three years or four years for the phosphates to the change to happen, they'll make, make metrics difficult. That's another thing. Uh, you've got the items you're, you're going, to, or the uh, chemicals and everything that you're going to be testing for, or do you have, are you gonna set trigger points or something that some, are you gonna publish metrics on a year by year basis? Or, you know, what, what are your thoughts on that? We're not there yet, but, um... We, we probably, first of all, I, we're not, we're, we're understanding this, we're preparing this for the town, for you. Okay, I got it. Effectively. I got it, all right. It's not what we are gonna be doing, it's what, what will you be doing with this plan once we presented it to the center and they've accepted okay. it. Um, right. But I would imagine, yes, there have to be, there have to be trigger points for, for some act for action to be taken. Uh, Hillary, do you know how often, if, if the National Seashore is taking samples, are they taking one a year? Uh, I think it depends. It depends on um, funding, staffing, and a whole host of issues. Um, like a couple summers back when we had, um, the cyanobacteria observed by one of their researchers in Gull Pond, they didn't sample, I don't think, that whole summer because of funding um, issues. So I think their data is spotty. Um, mm. That's why I think we should get with Sophia and see what they can commit to sampling into the future and what they can't, and then work with them closely because our data will be useful to them provided we collect it in, you know, an approved way and use an approved lab, so. It seems to me that just, they, they, too, they, they did not collect data in 2018 and 2019. Yeah. Certainly not because of Sophia, because they had no funding for it. Funding, that, yep. <clears throat> she had some funding to do 2020, but it's not like the old days. I have extensive files going back in the 80s and 90s at least for, for the Gold Pond area. I don't think their funding has been at that level 
for uh, many years. And Sophia's problem is that she doesn't know her funding more than a year in advance. Right. I mean, she can tell me what she's doing this year and, and what they think will be coming, but they're basically on annual budgets. Well, if the town's going to play an active part in this, then then we should put a uh, line item out for, for doing these tests, it would seem, that to ensure that there is some consistency independent of outside agents. Yeah. No, that's... Yes. Yeah. We can't depend on them, so let's do it the way that we think is right. It will. Whatever that is. It will cost money. Yeah. 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 Look, I, I've, um, I, Joanne Muramato gave me a couple of labs, but you know, there's no surprises there. It's just the labs are around, and one of our steps going along in this is is to get in touch with them and get mm -hmm. the cost. I put together a cost on this. Mm -hmm. That's great. That mm -hmm. will help us in the long run. Yes. Yeah. But it also will have. It's probably going to have to be. Hillary, probably somebody under your jurisdiction doing that testing. So, right. And, and I suppose once we have the parameters, um, mm -hmm. we can work with our summer samplers to like, th there's options, there's options to get it done. Okay, good. Right. good. Um, what else do we have? Do we, on our... Just looking at our list. Yeah. <laughs> Sources of funding. You mentioned Barnstable. Anybody have insights into state sources of funding for this type of? You know, I wonder. <clears throat> no, the, the short answer is no, but we can. Are we looking for money to draft the plan? No, no, not for that. No. Or to, to, to craft the mitigation work. Yes, and, and to take the base samples. Base samples. It's a question. We certainly, we're talking about samples once a year, minimum. When you talk to Joanne Muramato, her minimum would be twice a year, April, yeah. and, April and September, October, somewhere in there. Yeah. That would make sense. Yeah, and I think you would want to do that, especially when you're talking about oxygen levels in water. Uh, they have a great change in, over the years in that. And wouldn't it matter where you take the samples? <clears throat> Wasn't the issue about the cyanobacteria that one part of the pond didn't and another did have it? Well, I think you just have to be consistent where you take the samples. Where, you know, the, I only know in Gold Pond, it's, it's the, the, buoy out, the buoys out there marking yeah. where they do samples. And mm -hmm. I know for this, and Joanne, so, sorry. For the cyanobacteria testing program, we made sure that we, we tested the same location on the pond every time. So yes. And, and we also talked about testing at the top and mid and bottom strata too. Yeah. So, but we're, the, I guess we should emphasize, we're in the data gathering stage now. Mm -hmm. Yeah. We, we still have work to do with that before we're going to start putting a plan together. Mm -hmm. And I think it would, sounds like it'd be worthwhile for us to bring the plan back to you. It's some stage, intermediate stage. Yeah. I think it sounds great. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, that sounds good. Especially as it might end in your laps. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Yeah. Laura, anything else? I think I think that's all that was on our list. So we'll plan to check back in with you all as we get a little further down the trail. Well, great. Sounds great. Yeah, thank you. Very enlightening. I oh, didn't realize you. how spotty the, uh, the National Seashore was about the testing. Mm -hmm. So thanks for that. Well, it's, it's budget. It's nothing but budget. It's not their effort. It's budget. Mm -hmm. and, the, and the COVID years, they explained to me that they couldn't have two people handling a canoe to get the samples because they 
<laughs> they couldn't be six feet apart or something like that. So they couldn't do it for one summer because of COVID. <laughs> <laughs> Just amazing. Just well. Thank you all. Okay. Thank you guys. Thank you. Thank you. I think we'll start off and let you get on to your other business. But thanks. Thanks so much for your time. Thank you again. Okay. Bye bye. Bye bye. So Hillary, do we have yeah. any jurisdictional opinions? To pop no, on? we do not. Yeah. And no meat, no mail. Oh, you did have some mail that you sent us. You sent us one thing that said we should talk about during the business meeting. Oh yeah. Yes. Hold on one second. Let me pull that up. I sometimes forget what I send to you. Um, 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 um. I remember the flag, but not what it was for. <laughs> well, <this> is... <laughs> <laughs> we, we're supposed to talk about something. Are you thinking it... of the tree preservation initiative? Is that what no, it was? No, there was something else. No, um... I sent you the tree preservation initiative as well. But there was another email I had. Oh, the CYCC tent right, issue. The tents, right. Oh, okay. okay. And what I failed to send you was my follow up to him. Um, so I wanted you to see that because I suggested that he might want to. So here's my response. I said, hi, Barry. Unfortunately, you will need permission from the commission to erect any tent on that location. You could try the RDA form as it requires less information, but it seems your schedule for tents is extensive and they will really want to see a notice of intent. Why are you changing the tents out? The more use, the more detrimental to the area. So I haven't heard back from him today, but I still feel like we informed them over, well, not quite a year now, but we were out there in the summertime and we asked that they file an after the fact notice of intent for the deck work on the boathouse that wasn't permitted. And we asked that the tent structures not go up without filing a proper application before the commission. And we were rather clear, but now we're running up against his party schedule. And I, I don't understand the theory behind putting up a big tent for three parties, taking the tent down and putting up another tent for another party and so I feel like they need to just forge ahead and file the notice of intent for whatever the tent structure is that they want and not be changing the tents in and out because the more they use that area, the more it's going to erode and cause drainage issues that we already have on the site. And we still don't have the after the fact notice of intent for the work that was done without the permit. So. I get that they're having parties. I understand that, but we asked for this months and months and months ago. So yeah. I was um, just letting you know what they were thinking so that we would be prepared and make sure you still feel the same way that I feel that the notice of intent is the best application to move forward with. Well, when we talked to them, I recall that we were, our complaint was that they put up the tent for the whole season. Yes. Whereas before they would put it up and take it down. So yeah. are you suggesting that we we reverse our opinion on that? No, no, I'm suggesting they don't have permission. We gave them permission to get through the season. Mm -hmm. We did not give them any permission to move forward into this season. So, so what I'm saying is I feel like we should not approve willy-nilly applications for different tents at different times well, their intention I, is to tent that site for the whole party season i think we should wait for a concrete application and the after the fact application and review the whole site as one because yeah. it is one site so so that's what i suggested to barry and i don't know that that's going to align with his party schedule so i just wanted you to be prepared um for a discussion that might be coming soon sounds okay. good yeah I, I agree and even though you know they want different kinds of tents for different events they have to explain themselves and show us what they look like how how big they're going to be um yeah. how they're going to be uh, held down all that kind of stuff uh i i think it's important that that we don't allow last summer's tent situation to become a new baseline 
I mean, when we talked to them last time, we were, they kept saying, this is because of COVID. It's only because of COVID. We had to do this because yeah. of COVID. And we were fairly sympathetic, but I don't like the idea that they're going to sort of use what they did last year as sort of create a new idea that, well, we should have this tent more permanently here because we did it before. Well, I think too, we're going to see this in a couple other locations. I'm thinking, um, I'm thinking uh, Max Shack might want to put their tent back up. I'm thinking the Pearl might want to put a tent back up. Um, <laughs> You're right. <laughs> uh, I'm just trying to think of the other locations. And I mean, different, different locations are different, right? We can acknowledge right. that like the Max Shack tent is in a parking lot you know, they're, they're all a little different and they're all a little bit unique. So mm -hmm. I think we have to view them as they come before us and we can't issue a blanket statement that, you know, all temporary tents are okay. Cause that's not really quite the case. So mm -hmm. just food for thought for us moving ahead because I think we're gonna see more of this post COVID, you know, emergency operations. Okay. Any other thoughts on that? Okay. We have some meeting minutes to uh, accept. Can we just talk quickly before sure. you jump to meeting minutes about violations that we're yep. following up on and okay. oh, sorry. Yep. just because you weren't all in the car with us today. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I got the one down. What's the problem? Um, we've made contact with 50 West Main Street. We sent the letter, so he's in the process of taking some action. Uh, looks like salty, the old salty duck pottery um, paved a portion of their driveway or put down some hardener, so they're getting a letter. We saw another property out today on a Lieutenant Island site visit that has built a shrub berm, for lack of better terminology, <laughs> for what we observed. Um, and then I think Leon had one more down on Old Chiquesset Neck that we have not checked out yet. So 465. 465. And there was one at Buttery. And there was one on Buttery. Oh, and then there's the one on Buttery Way, um, who we specifically had in the order not to store boats under the deck. And boats are being stored under the deck. So they're getting a letter. Um, we were out at 164 Cliff Road this morning and they had some issues on their site. I spoke with Gary and um, those were remedied this morning. So that one is not getting a letter. So that's good. Um, we could take that off the list. And that's one place that had the drain. The drain yep, we saw the drain. We'll talk pump. about that during the meeting. And okay. I think that might wrap up that. Oh, we have yes. to go out and snoop some more. <laughs> <laughs> Give you some more work to do. <laughs> yeah, we're good. <laughs> we're keeping busy over here. Don't worry. Oh, yeah. <laughs> okay, can I go on to meeting minutes now? Yes. Does anybody else have anything else they'd like to talk about? Not the meeting minutes. Or well, I just, I just wanted to. Um, point out that I went to the website and it looks like John Cumbler and I are uh, terms are up in June and it looked like Michael's Fisher's term was up last June. Yeah, so I, Michael, think, yeah. I think okay. I was renewed. You were. Okay. On the, I'm just looking at the website. Um, still, I hope we're still looking for more commissioners. We are always actively looking, Barbara, but um, people aren't coming out of the woodwork here. <laughs> so you can't go unless you get a replacement. Okay. <laughs> Same goes for Nick. <laughs> no one leaves unless they have someone to take their seat. Okay. We have, or Michael has circulated uh, the minutes for the February 2nd meeting. I viewed them and Barbara's seen them and worked on them. Has everybody else had a chance to take a look at them real quick? So I move that we approve the meeting minutes for February the 2nd meeting. Second. Second. <laughs> okay, good. Now that we got that together. Uh, Michael, how do you vote? 
Yes. And Barbara? Yes. And I vote yes. Benjamin? Yes. And John? I wasn't at that meeting. Okay. Well, we still have a quorum, so we're good to go. Okay. That order. Is there anything else that we should talk about? Or should we take a 10 minute break for a very long hearing? A, a break sounds good. I am thinking of taking another summer sabbatical from the commission. So we can talk about that closer to make sure that there's a quorum for each. And, and if we're meeting in person or not, because yeah. it, it might be time to talk about having a hybrid. Um, yeah, and we will, we will be able to have hybrid um, starting in April. So we can, we can do hybrid sooner rather than later. In the, in the basement? I think it's at the COA. Oh, good. Yeah. So good. it's a nice, it's a nice setup and apparently we'll have all the modern technology to do Excellent. so. Excellent. So. That sounds great. Great. But we might yeah. have to change our meeting night or time because of there's one room evidently that they're going to have. Um, I'll check with Rebecca Eldridge on scheduling. Um, I know at our last Board of Health meeting, we talked about going back to in-person too for our April meeting. So she seemed to think the capability was there and there were no issues. So um, let me double check that. And the other thing is we still have to schedule a doodle poll for our meeting on the regulations and bylaws, which I haven't forgotten about. My schedule is just a little crazy. So I'll get that out soon. Okay, great. Great, that's all I got. Okay, I move that we adjourn for until five o'clock. Second. So all right, Barbara, how do you vote? Yes, yes. I vote yes. Benjamin, how do you vote? Yes. John? Yes. And Michael? Yes. Okay, I'll see you in 10 minutes or five o'clock, whatever that is. Is here. Is John here? Hi, Judith. John, we're waiting for you. <laughs> Michael, are you here? Nope. Benjamin, are you here? Yes. No. Yeah, I'm here. I was just muted. Oh, okay. Good. So if we can get John and Benjamin here. Benjamin, are you here? Still not quite there then. I'm going to go ahead and read the paragraph, and hopefully we'll get everybody here by then. John's Pursuant just appeared. I'm here. Hey, he's here. Pursuant to Massachusetts General Laws, Chapter 30A, paragraphs 18 through 25, as amended by Chapter 28 of the Acts of 2009, the Wetlands Protection Act, and to the Wellfleet Environmental Protection Bylaw of July 1986 and its regulations of January 2000, the Wellfleet Conservation Commission will hold public hearings on Wednesday, March 16th, 2022 at 5 p.m. via Zoom. Currently, we have uh, the members of the commission include John Cumbler, myself, Leon Shrees, Barbara Brennesel, Benjamin Fairbank, and Michael Fisher. So we have a quorum of five. Okay, the first hearing is um, Mass Audubon, Map 41, Parcel 182, RDA, Phil Road with two inches of sand at east end of Lieutenant Island Road Causeway. Is that correct? Did I read that properly? About two inches of sand? Ian? Oh, yes. Okay, so, all right, fine. We'll be talking about that. Yeah. Oh. <clears throat> Why don't you, uh, Catch us up from when we talked last when you were talking about gravel and now what you're suggesting. Sure, the continuation. <laughs> yeah. yeah, so, so I sought feedback from um, Hillary as to some alternatives for um, gravel. And after a lot of additional research, some calls made, some discussion, it seemed as though the sand possibility was um, more appealing and and um, the route we wanted to take. So I um, I took a look locally to see if there was some um, substrate that met um, the the criteria 
uh, Hillary was asking that, you know, we made sure that we um, identified where the sand was going to be, um, the type of sand, and um, the amount that we plan to use. So after doing some work, we, we found some, um, a, a, a distributor, Brewster Sand and Gravel, uh, not far away in East Ham, that has a couple different products uh, that seemed suitable, one of which was screen sand, as they call it, which is, uh, they describe as a coarse native bank sand uh, that has been run through a, a three quarter inch sieve or screener to remove things, you know, obviously anything larger than three quarters inch. And apparently it's been used for beach nourishment in the past. Um, backfilling um, applications, they also use it for um, sandbox sand. Another product um, that is sourced from various locations apparently is called bank sand, which is unscreened. And that comes locally, apparently right there on their site which is a consideration. And it's, uh, it's coarse sand suitable for drainage as in septic systems or backfilling foundations. But since it's not screened, it might have some larger debris that sits inside of it. Or other, you know, naturally occurring debris as they call it. Mm -hmm. So those were two of the most, I thought most suitable alternatives to what we had originally proposed. The fact that they're locally sourced seemed uh, good. Also, the fact that they've been used in applications like this mm -hmm. seemed good. Um, in terms of the amount, having been, been, at, been back out there and looking with a tape measure a little more carefully at it, I would think it's going to be more than what I had originally proposed of around 380 or so square feet. I think it might be maybe close to 600, maybe 700. Um, and it's a cubic foot dimension, by the way. I, I, that was a typo when I put in square foot. I meant to say cubic feet. So again, the, the size of the hole is about um, 32 by 12 by 13 inches deep. But there's some variability depending on the year, as you can imagine, the time of year, rather. Mm -hmm. So I think to be safe, I uh, probably would anticipate being, you know, like I said, probably closer to 700 or so. But I don't really have any exact way of knowing right now exactly how much we'd be putting in. Because again, a lot of this hat would have to do with how much additional sand we want to have above the rut to account for settling and displacement. If you put too little, it's not going to do anything. If you put too much, I think you're going to end up having a mound. So that's also something for discussion. Do you know, do you know Ian, who you would contract with to do the work? Yeah, so, well, this, oh, Oh, we would contract with uh, Brewster Sand and Gravel I'm proposing, but then to do the work, we would need a skid steer and we would need um, some sort of a vehicle to get the, the sand there. Um, so because Mass Audubon's paying for the, the job, you know, we anticipate looking for a couple of different options and making the decision on how we would, how we would do it based on that. I think it's likely that we'd um, rent the equipment and do it ourselves to save some money. Um, again, we haven't priced out the cost of, of the fill yet. Mm -hmm. um, it would be really great to have um, the sand and gravel company deliver it, dump it, and spread it for us right there on the site. It's not a big job. It just requires the right equipment. You know? I mean, a shovel isn't going to be an option. That's we're going to need to have we're going to need to have uh, some machinery to do it. Yeah. Any questions from the commission? Have you thought about whether it's groundwater coming up or seawater coming in or a combination? Yeah, that's a good question. I think it is a com. I mean, the hydrology out there is really variable with all of the. Um, changes to, you know, the historic changes to the salt marsh and the road. I think there's um, a variety of different means. It may not always be natural. I, I think about Barnesville Harbor and the mosquito ditches, or mosquito ditches that you see anywhere across the Cape and how they impact the hydrology of the upper marsh like this. Um, 
but I think the compaction there on the the existing compaction on on um, Meadow Road is that what it's called, by the way? That little path. It's so, a path. It's not a. Is it called Meadow yeah. Path? Meadow, whatever. Not, it's not a road. Okay, yeah. Uh, I'm using the word Meadow Road because I heard someone call it that. Um, I think there's a variety of different, but you need a hydrologist out there, obviously, to to get an exact idea as to what's going on. Barbara, go ahead. Yeah, I'm, I'm very conflicted about this proposal. Um, I really want to support the shell fishermen. Um, and I really want to thank Audubon for going above and beyond to be good neighbors and to accommodate their need for access. But um, I just want to state my concerns for the record. Um, this is not a real road. It's, it's not on any map, assessor's map. Um, in my uh, being out there a lot for terrapin work. Um, this to me is part of the salt marsh and it's a budding and upland coastal bank. So I think it's a resource area. Uh, it's not a road, it's not a path. It wasn't a path until people started driving on it. If people hadn't driven on it, it would look the same as just north of the Lieutenant Island Bridge. If you ever walk that marsh, um, there's, just, there's really no path. There's just a delineation between the marsh, the low marsh and the high marsh and the, the upland coastal bank. Um, the shell fishermen in their regulations have permission to drive on the beach and into tidal areas that are approved by the Conservation Commission. To me, this isn't a beach and it's not an intertidal area that's been approved by the Conservation Commission. So I think it would revegetate as a marsh if people start stop driving on it. Um, if you go to Google Earth and look at the area and do a retrospective, you can see that there was always a hole there. But in the last five years, it's filled with water and it hardly it doesn't drain at all. Um, so I had the same question Michael did. Where's the water coming from? Is it um, not draining or is it? continue to flood in. And if you look at Google Earth also, you'll see that there's a marsh channel that leads to the puddle. I don't know what the hydrology is there, but there is a channel that goes right to that puddle uh, on Google Earth. So it's a very dynamic little puddle. <laughs> I mean, it's changing all the time and it's changed a lot uh, just since I've been going out there in 10 years and the last five years. It's, it hardly ever drains, it continues to be filled with water. Um, I think I would love to provide, continue to provide vehicle access, but I think I also feel a duty to protect the wetland resources, which I'm on this commission for. I don't wanna set a precedent either uh, because this is gonna happen more and more as sea level rises. So um, as I said, I'm very conflicted. It's different from Sandy Neck because the Sandy Neck um, does lead to cottages and cabins, so people's homes are there. This doesn't lead to anything. Uh, there's no houses, no structures, nothing. And um, there was a comment made last time that IFA uh, needs to use this road, but John Cumbler and I are IFA volunteers, and they never use that road. They park at the bridge, and we have a cart with big wheels that we trudge out there and extract uh, marine dolphins and we trudge it, you know, we wheel it back. They never drive on that. So IFA doesn't need access uh, there either. So um, those, are, those are my comments about this project. As I said, I'm very conflicted. I wanna support the shell fishermen, but I have a lot of issues with this particular site. Are there any, uh, Benjamin? Yeah, I just, um, I would echo Barbara's concerns from both like a practical standpoint and a jurisdictional standpoint. I, not, I, I, I just don't know that we really can approve something like this. And then like legally speaking, but also practically what I worry about is filling sand and then it's just going to move the puddle you know, to the side of it or something, it's going to just alter the hydrology of it, but not actually fix the problem. So I, I, 
has the Autobot explored any alternatives that are thing like these these mats that you can place down that have low impact or anything that can be temporary so that um, we don't run into kind of creating a problem and the existing problem stays the same at the same time. I haven't explored mats, but I, I'm not sure how they would work in that environment and whether you would, well, I'll just leave it at that. I don't see how they would, how they would work in that environment. Yeah, I was just giving an example. Yeah, you like know, I understand. Yeah. There are alternatives. Yeah. Like... In the research we've done, this was really the only th two things that we could come up with. Hmm. John? Yeah, I, I guess I'm going to support what Benjamin just said, that the thing that bothers me about this is it seems from looking at the map and from being out there, a channel is coming in from the, the larger bay and moving to that puddle. And as the sea level rises, that channel is become, going to become more and more permanent. And what I don't like is the idea that we're going to create a situation where they're going to be having to continually re-sand the puddle because the puddle wants to be a, uh, an end source for the water coming in from the bay. I mean, that's what's going on there. And the sand is just gonna to try to push it out the sand's either going to wash away and the puddle will be back, or which is a problem because where will the sand go? Um, or the puddle will form on either side. I, the other concern is this is this can't this, there is no long-term solution to this problem with the sand option. What has to be explored is an alternative access route to those shellfish beds. Like what happens to Catfish Road or Cat Boat Road? Uh, is there a way to get from the end of Cat Boat, Cat Boat Road down to the beach that doesn't end up getting vehicles going across what will be um, effectively a permanent wet area? So I'm, and I'm, I'm just not, I think it's a temporary solution. If this were, this is for this year, um, and then, then we're not gonna come back and do it again next year. We're gonna try to find an alternative solution. I think I could go for that, but I can't just go for, well, we're putting sand down this year, and then next year, we're gonna be in the same spot. They're gonna need more sand. So I, I, wanna, I wanna, and either this is a one-off deal, and then we're going to explore an alternative, or, um, or I think the shell fishermen need to explore other ways to get to their, their. And I and I look, I want to support the shellfish community. I definitely think this is important for our community, and I don't like the idea of kind of turning all our resource into just protected areas or museums. I like the idea of utilizing resources, but this bothers me. Uh, Mr. Blanchard, do you have your hand up? No, I guess not, sorry. Any other statements by, by the public? Okay. We do, uh, Leon, we do have um, the two letters that we should read into the record, um, which I will do. Um, we have to the Wellfleet Conservation Commission um, regarding the repair of the mud hole located on Assessor's Map 41, Parcel 182. The Wellfleet Shellfish Advisory Board is writing to, our, to express our support for the application submitted by the Massachusetts Bay Wildlife Sanctuary to make repairs as necessary for vehicle access across the above referenced parcel. Having previously discussed this at our November 18th, 2021 meeting, our board determined that this long established vehicle access for shell fishing at Silver Spring Harbor should be preserved. A large mud puddle near the intersection of Lieutenant Island Road has become problematic for vehicle passage and repairs are required at this time. 
as access to the shellfish and flats is a substantial distance from the mud puddle, carrying a heavy load of shellfish is impractical. This letter expresses our support for an environmentally sound strategy for managing, for, sorry, for maintaining vehicle access to the shellfish beds and tidal flats south of this parcel. Sincerely, John Duane on behalf of the Wellfleet Shellfish Advisory Board, Rebecca Taylor, Chair, Zach Dixon, John Duane, Damon Parkington, and Tom Sigia. The next one, um, dear members of the commission, thank you for considering the Audubon's revised application to fill in the puddle in the sand road that leads to the end of Doctors Hill, southeast of the Lieutenant Island Bridge. Given the number of questions raised about the original proposal at the September 15th public hearing, we felt it would be helpful to provide you with additional information. We have heard from our shellfishing community that this is an important access point for wild commercial and recreational shellfishing that we cannot afford to lose. The sand road leads to a very productive salt marsh in Silver Spring Harbor, which wild harvesters depend on for their livelihoods throughout the winter. This road remains the only means of accessing the area, which is necessary to do by vehicle for shell fishermen and shellfish constables both for the ability to carry out their jobs and to keep each other safe. We have been working with Mass Audubon to try and remediate a solution that will address public safety, preserve public access, and prevent any incidents that may threaten the marsh. Sand fill in this area would match the substrate of the road and could help to stabilize the marsh around the puddle. It would provide much needed relief for safe passage without compromising the health of the salt marsh or the stability of the dune. As a committee and a department, we view sea level rise as a, press, as a present and ongoing threat to the public's means of accessing the water. We are currently assessing our town's access points to identify vulnerable areas and to seek both short-term solutions and longer-term alternatives. Our longer-term alternatives are often the results of a search for higher ground which in this case are limited to one private road with no public rights to pass or park and weak potential for that to change. While we are considering it, we recognize how challenging and lengthy these processes can be when negotiating public access over private property. These efforts take time, patience and endurance and do not always end in success. In the meantime, we believe filling the puddle in with sand is a reasonable means of preserving vehicle access in the short term, however long that may be. These access issues are ones that will affect not only shell fishermen, but also an entire community of homeowners on Lieutenant Island, not to mention the entire Outer Cape. Addressing shorter term solutions will be equally as important as finding longer term solutions in all cases. We ask that you consider the importance of both. We hope we can work together in the future to respond to the dynamic changes in the environment with adaptability and endurance. Please find additional information from a shell fisherman's perspective attached. We hope you find this information helpful and look forward to discussing the matter with you at the public hearing on March 16th. Thank you for your time. Melissa Yao on behalf of the Wellfleet Rights of Public Access Committee and Nancy Chivetta on behalf of the Wellfleet Shellfish Department. And the document goes on to say, what does the extra distance to Lieutenant Island Road mean to a shell fisherman? When you're carrying 100 to 150 pounds to your truck in winter after hours of digging or picking day in and day out, an extra quarter mile haul to Lieutenant Island Road from the end of Ring Road, no matter the equipment used, can be the difference between an intense cardio workout and a heart attack. Silver Spring Harbor is already a notoriously difficult area to shellfish where it's not uncommon to battle extreme wind and get sucked into the mud. These conditions in the remoteness of the area are a recipe for problems with public safety if vehicle access is lost. Compare the access points in Silver Spring Harbor to those in Chipman's Cove. The distance between the two points in the cove demonstrates what kind of vehicle access is necessary to make shell fishing for a living possible. Each is about a quarter mile apart. That's the correspondence. And who, who wrote that? That was from Melissa and Nancy Chavetta. Oh, oh okay. Yeah, and we Nancy, got we got those in our email today. Right. Or yes. Okay, good. Are you on the phone, Nancy? She Nancy says, is on the phone. Um, 
She's on okay. patrol, so we may or may not be able to hear. Right. Well, I'm going to ask her. Start talking. <laughs> if she unmutes, I'll let you know so we can talk with her. Okay. Can I just say, again, one of the things that bothers me in the letters was the reference to the repair of the road, because we're not repairing a road. It's not a road. It's it, we're putting sand in a, uh, you know, a wet in a marsh. And that, I don't, I'm not saying we shouldn't do it. I'm just saying if we go down the road of a repair of a road, then what we're doing is setting up a precedent for continual dumping of sand in, and chant, transforming that wetland. And that bothers me. I want some sort of time limit on the sand dumping before I feel comfortable with this. Yeah, can I say something first, Hillary? Yeah. Uh, my opinion is that it's taken a lot of years for that sand to erode out. Nothing is really supplying sand to that. So it's not like a highly active area like, like we've been involved with all along the, uh, the bay. But if we put in some sand there, enough to stabilize that area, even if it's a short term, it, in a year or two, we may find out that hey, actually it's not, it's going okay. I mean, there's the need, what are we gonna hurt, I guess, is my question. Your, your question, John, seemed to be more to do with continual uptake, uptake. I'm not saying that's a good idea, but I think that it would be a good idea to try this, give people access now and then, let the future we'll deal with the future in the future barbara go ahead yeah i just want to answer your question um and it's it's referred to in the letters that this would would not compromise the health of the, the marsh we don't know that because we don't know where the sand's going to go it can cover the spartina um it could prevent the grass from we don't know so that bothers me too it, it's a it's a question uh right. that i have um, well yeah, I would suggest that since we don't know, and there's no way to find out other than trying it, that we try it one season and see what happens. Because if it if it's slowly going out, that sand will just raise the marsh, right? I mean, it'll sink down into the roots and they'll grow above it. It's not like there's a big tidal flow to there. I think it probably just creeps in and then creeps out and it seems to be filling this declivity now every high tide. It, um, thank you for letting me say my, go ahead, Hillary. So I, I think we've tried, we've tried um, sand and grading on other parts on Lieutenant's Island Road, on Old Wharf Road and on Old Briarcliff. So we have had, um, we have done this type of work in the past in other locations around town. Granted, I understand Barbara's point that those roads access dwellings. Um, I think public access is also an interesting thing that we need to preserve here. I've spoken to a number of shell fishermen um, in the past couple of weeks and, and they do claim to have used this access for many years. So um, I think it is it is a legit public access and it is the only public access at this time out to that area. I also, we were out there um, this afternoon, Leon, myself, Michael Fisher and Meredith, just looking at the distance from, you know, where you could park to the actual fishing grounds. And it is a decent way. So I think the idea of a wheeled cart, um, I just don't think that's possible. So. I think if we allow this one time, we can observe it, we can see. We know that the marshes need more sediment and we, we do beach nourishment all over in front of marshes. And I think we're talking about six to 700 cubic feet. We know this isn't gonna be the solution into the future. And I think the fishermen know that as well and the public access committee are aware of that. And I think we can all commit to finding another access to this this location while we see if this short-term solution works. So I don't think a one-time placement of sand is gonna be detrimental to the marsh. Um, and I think it might be worth looking into, you know, other avenues to get to that fishing ground if, if there are any possibilities out there while we try this, so. I agree. 
Any other comments or questions? Um, I mean, I, uh, I, I, I wanna, I, I know I'm, I'm, I don't, I don't mean to keep beating on this, but um, Hillary said at one time, talk to me about what that means. That uh, means they fill, they fill, they fill the hole now. Right. Um, and then we see, we watch it and see what happens. So they cannot do it again without coming back to us. And, and what assurance do we have? I mean, not assurance, but um, I'm concerned that they come, you know, it, you know, it works for a year and then they come back and say, this worked. Uh, now we want to do it again. And you let us do it before and it works. So now we want to do it again. And then we're the question, the question though, John, is is it detrimental to the marsh? Did it cause damage to the marsh? Right. If it's not damaging the marsh and right. it's not you. causing harm, then then it's fine and it's permittable. If it's causing harm and it's damaging the marsh and the grass is dying, then we say, nope, we can't allow this again. We need to, we need to start looking for alternative access. And I think the public access committee and the shell fishermen are committed to looking for another access point. I just don't think they've had any success in that yet. So, so, I mean, we can all acknowledge sea level is rising and we need to adapt to what's going on out there, but this is probably an area we want to focus on sooner than some other areas. If it's that important to our fishing community. Can I just say a word about that? I got Mr. Blanchard. He wanted sure, to go ahead. get the head of you in the line. Go ahead, Mr. <laughs> Blanchard. Uh, yes, I'm uh, apparently the only member from the uh, Rights Public Access Committee present. And we did uh, worry about calling it a road. We know it's not a road, but that's what everybody calls it. So that's what it was in that letter. Uh, we have looked for an alternative uh, access and it, might be possible, but uh, actually one of our shell fishermen tried to use that access with, without it being paved. Um, and it's quite a steep climb. And it was just as hard to carry her 150 pounds of uh, shellfish up that slope to the road as it was to hike it the quarter mile up to uh, the parking area by the, by the uh, Lieutenant Island access road. Um, that's what I have to say. And we do know that if uh, if the sand goes away after a year or two or three, that we'll have to come back to you. And at that point, we'll have to figure out if there was any damage to the uh, mat marsh, if uh, the putting in the sand was and uh, didn't cause any problems, but did allow access to the uh, uh, Silver Harbor uh, area, then uh, good. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Ian? Yeah, no, I just, I just wanted to reiterate what we said from the outset that our intention was that this would be a one-time application really intended to buy time, mm -hmm. as you're all saying. And um, given our resource, limited resources at Mass Audubon, we just don't feel like we have the capacity to be able to do multiple rounds of this. So this was really a one offer. Well, that makes me feel uh, better about the project, knowing that because once again, when we set a precedent, um, it's not just going to be here, but other places as well as sea level rises. And I think we really have to be more creative about um, maintaining these access points. Did you have something you want to say? Yeah, I think that um, you know, I, all said and done, the, these conditions make me feel better too, but I wonder, is there somewhere else on the property that where we can condition mitigation as part of this? Is there that the Audubon can do? Hmm. Planting uh, somewhere where I, there's impact. I don't know. Um, we, could, we could condition it such that if there's damage or death of the Spartina, it gets replaced. Um, but I don't know where they would offer mitigation because that space is, it's, it's not really degraded, the marsh there. So I don't, yeah. I'm not sure about, I'm not sure about mitigation unless of course there's damage. Right, right. I think that's, I mean, right now we're filling a hole with sand. It's a hole that people drive over. So it's 
that's a fairly low risk as long as we can keep an eye on what's going on with with the uh, the grasses in the marsh. Um, seems like that. I mean, yes, there are questions, but the only way on this one, I think that we're going to get an answer is to try. Any other comments? Okay, I move that we accept or that we approve the. Uh, what is this? This is an RDA. RDA. RDA from Mass Audubon, Map 41, parcel 182. To negative two. All right. Is there a second? Yes, Michael. All right. Benjamin, how do you vote? Yes. Barbara? Let's see if there are enough votes without me. Because I'm really, I'm, I'm sure. just yeah. okay. in the air. No, that's good. John, how do you vote? Um, I, I was going to do what Barbara just did, but I can't since she did it first. <laughs> yeah. I'm going to say um, on, I, I feel much more confident now that Audubon has assured us this is a one-off deal. Um, so based on that assurance, I will vote yes. Well, it needs to be more than assurance. It has to be a condition. It has to be a condition of the RDA. Right. So the condition would be that uh, this is a one-time non-precedent setting. Right. Yep. And that any damage would be uh, repaired. Correct. Are you okay with that, Ian? Yeah. Well, yeah. yeah, I'm just trying to think about that because that, that adds a whole other level of responsibility, doesn't it? Yeah, that does. Yeah. I mean, that, that, does. Yeah, that could cost more than the actual act itself. Yeah, <laughs> I, 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 I would anticipate it. But yeah. yeah, I mean, that that's yeah. something I would need to think about, I think. Uh, yeah. We weren't prepared to be doing mitigation in the case of, of this, of yeah, this I, patch one time. I, I think having an open ended, uh, mm. I think that's a little tough. Mm. I vote yes for the condition of the one time, but that's it. Michael, how do you vote? Yes. Okay, so we got four yeses. Barbara, you want to come back around? Um, I'll, I'll just abstain for now. Just okay. So it's four, zero, one, is that right? Okay, all right, you're good to go. It'll be interesting to see how this goes. So just to clarify, where do things stand with the mitigation piece? Uh, um, right now. Mm -hmm. I was gonna say, if there's damage from the sand and the Spartina dies off, we will require it to be replaced. Mm -hmm. So that might be something we'd wanna consider then whether we're willing to go down that road is yeah well, you don't have to do the like project I need due diligence on that one before we we accept that would you say due diligence in from our team and discuss this with sure no i understand yeah yeah seems I rather open-ended are we going to go with this people I, I, think, I think the commission voted. Um, they made their decision. If the Mass Autobahn wants to come back and further discuss mitigation or remediation, um, we can take up the matter again. But I think our intention is to allow access and preserve the marsh. And so if the Spartina dies, we want to ensure that it goes back because the marsh is what we're protecting. So. Um, we, we put these conditions on all projects um, that if there's any damage, it gets returned to its pre-construction condition or its pre, um, you know, mm. what it was like before we allowed the project to move forward. So we can't as a commission um, have a project that could cause damage and not have a way to, to remedy or mitigate it. Um, that being said, I don't think the placement of six to 700 cubic feet of sand is gonna kill the marsh or the marsh grass. But that's obviously something that you need to consider because you're the applicant. Um, yeah. or before, and I know I voted, but I want to, um, what is the exact amount we're talking about here? Six to 700 cubic feet. Is 700 then a maximum? Yes. Absolute maximum. That's what we have in the record. Okay, because you know we've had in the past 
where we didn't actually spell out what the maximum was and then changed dramatically over time. Mm -hmm. So the, the no more than 700. Everybody that voted okay with that? Yeah, well, that was the application. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I will say also on the record that, you know, it's our top priority to protect the marsh <laughs> as a conservation yeah. organization. Right. right, so we we wouldn't have proposed this if we didn't think that there, if, if we thought that there was a risk to the marsh in doing so. I guess one of the questions would be what what qualifies as damage to the Spartina in the eyes of the mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Oscom and everybody else. Right. <laughs> yeah. Well, that's... Right, and, and that's a tough one, Ian, because yeah. you could have salt marsh die back there due just to sea level rise, and we don't know if it's the puddle or the that's sand. What I mean. How or, do you? Or yeah, a sea level rise, so it, it's very tough to assess that. Yeah. Why don't we agree that we will we will entertain discussions when there is a problem, and that we I all think that, are the that, same that, team. That's too open ended. I think, Leon. I think you have to have wording that can be, um, okay. can, you know, followed through, enforced, or whatever. Right. Um, we have to protect protect the integrity of the marsh. Right. And so that means if there is damage, it will be mitigated or remedied. And once damage is observed, if it is observed, we will go out there and, and have a look. And I think, you know, we'll be able to tell if the grass is smothered or, right. you know, I, I think we'll, we, we're gonna be able to tell in the short yeah. term with a couple well, of I think we'll also cars. be able to tell if the uh, hole appears again. Exactly. Okay, we voted. I, uh, as far as uh, I think we're going to keep that in there, the uh, mitigation, if necessary. Um, okay. Leon, it does look like Nancy's here and she's unmuted. I don't know if she okay, um, Nancy, do you have has anything to, to add to the conversation. Well, yeah. I mean, thank you. Can you hear me? Yes. 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 I mean, I just, I had plenty that I wanted to say, but it seemed like you all were, were going in a direction of giving this a shot. I think that everybody, especially Audubon, is interested in making sure that there's no detrimental effects. And they've, they've come to you twice with um, ideas that have worked for them in other places on the Cape. And um uh, so I feel confident that Audubon is not going to want to do anything to damage the marsh, but of course monitoring will happen so that we can keep our eyes on it and make sure. Um, I, I feel um, in my position, but also just as a community member here in Wellfleet, that the preservation of this access, uh, which provides year-round jobs for our community, is just as, if not more important than providing access to seasonal homeowners. And and I think that we really need to think as a community about this. And, you know, as Hillary said, there were, um, you know, that there have been precedents set around town that are similar. So I, I feel like everybody here is doing their absolute best to make sure that this is a solution we understand is a, a short-term solution, while maybe we look for other ways to uh, protect this access. Uh, and I appreciate you all voting to support that. It 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 means a lot, and I think <clears throat> that it, it sets a precedent for uh, caring about shell fishing as a way of life here, and and the importance to our community to being a year round, um, a year round functioning town as opposed to, um, you know, just a tourist yeah. uh, summer place. So I appreciate that, and and I think we all have the exact same. Um, goals in mind. We want to preserve the marsh and we want to allow access. So I, I thank you all for your thoughtful conversation and Hillary for your uh, contributions tonight. Thank you, Nancy. Uh, Leon, okay. I just wanted to say really just follow up on what Nancy just said. I, I want, if in the event that they, that we have to revisit this in a year or so, because I'm I'm personally of the mind that I I think the sand is all going to go away and the puddle is just going to happen again. That's my opinion. Um, but 
that said, I, I just, I would be really interested to hear about al alternatives that, you know, that just require a little bit more time to study and research. But I know that there are a lot of really interesting technologies out there with uh, getting improving access, uh, you know, through a wetland or near a wetland um, without impacting the substrate and the vegetation and um for the for next time i would be really interested right. to to hear about that who is that speaking, who is that speaking? sorry because i'm on a phone that was benjamin this, oh sorry this is benjamin fairbank sorry okay that, that sounds that sounds great i i agree yeah. with you yeah and i i think that uh i think what nancy said about us all being on the same having the same goals is important too but we have to go by by fact and not avoid something that needs to be done by because there's questions. We have to figure out a way to understand what's going on. And as far as precedences go, every every situation is different. So that needs to be understood. That's why we can't have we have guidelines and rules, but we make waivers where appropriate. Uh, so just because we're doing this here doesn't mean that it can be done at XYZ. It's, it's a case by case situation. All right. Okay. Those, who, those who voted um, form two, sign form two, if you voted in favor of this. Some people will do anything not to make a sign. <laughs> <laughs> okay, great. Let's move on. The next one is Parsons, 130 Sandpiper Hill Road, map 22, parcel 10, an RDA to replace the deck in the same location. I think we've seen this place before. Did we miss discussing it at some point? They, did, they didn't come to the last meeting, last yeah, two meetings. Right. right. Is there somebody to represent this project? Well, I'm here from uh, Nickerson Home Improvement, if you can hear me. Yeah, uh, yeah. I can hear you. So what do we got here, Mr. Nickerson? Well, what we're doing is we're replacing a deck exactly the same way that it is. Uh, it's a 10 by 20 pressure treated deck with uh, like three, three, four steps down towards the ocean and one step off the side. Okay, are you using the same foundation? Where that's what the intention is right now. Oh, uh, Leon, I have a couple yes. of questions. Certainly, Mike. Michael, uh, go ahead. First of all, there is a canvas canopy over it now that's retractable. Are you at all uh, doing anything about that? I'm not doing any. In, in my plan, there is no plan for the awning or the canvas or anything like that. Okay, and the spacing is going to be the same? The spacing will be 16 inches on center, if that's the question. No, spacing between the, between the boards? Yes, the spacing will be the same. Okay, and then, as you know, uh, everything in the area between the coastal bank and 50 feet is in our jurisdiction. Yes, and the this is clearly within that within that area. Right now, there is an outdoor shower that's also in that area. Correct. And that outdoor shower doesn't seem to have any sort of draining. It's simply uh, draining right into the into the buffer zone into the filter strip rather. Mm -hmm. Okay. It's, uh, I, I'm kind of dealing with the deck. I, yeah, I know, know, but this is this is a project that is within our jurisdiction. Okay. And you're going to be, you know, there's going to be some construction, the, the, there's going to be some compression uh, of the ground because of the, uh, because of the equipment that you're using. Uh, and so what we're, what I'm suggesting is that it would be a very valuable enhancement of the environmental uh, effects of, of this house 
if that shower, that outdoor shower had a nitrogen reduction system underneath it. It's not complicated. It's simply uh, layers of wood chips underneath uh, where people stand so that the nitrates and the phosphates all uh, uh, get absorbed. Did the owners have any intention of doing anything like that? I, I haven't addressed it with the owners because um, we didn't know that it was an issue. Um, uh, yeah, it's not, it's not even clear if that shower was ever permitted. Yeah. So before I voted to approve this, I think that it's a reasonable project, but I do feel that the environmental effects of the house would be would be improved if that shower were uh, turned into a nitrogen reduction shower. And by that, you mean put wood chips on the ground? Well, mm -hmm. now you, you, you have essentially a dry well underneath it with sand, wood chips, sand. So that the water goes through that and the wood chips evidently take care of the nitrogen. Yes. Okay, we can look, we can look it up and uh, I, I will address it with a homeowner. Um, it doesn't sound like it's a major deal. Mm -hmm. Well, it it's should, not a- it, it shouldn't be. Not, not from a- um, It can make a big difference as far as uh, what it does to the beta. So, I'm sorry? I said it can, it, it's a very small thing to do. It's inexpensive. And, easy to do, but it does make a big difference. It can make a big difference in the quality of the bay. Otherwise, okay. all, the, all the phosphates and nitrates just go right into the, into the bay. Yeah, this, and there's a shellfishing grounds out there too. So um, I think that this is a good opportunity to get this on the plot plan, get it permitted as part of the deck renovation project which seems very straightforward, but, but this is um, something that we're doing. It's, we're not singling out this homeowner. We're suggesting if everyone that has what they're calling rinsing stations in uh, the buffer zone of a wetland resource. Particularly if it's not been approved before. Right. Which I don't know, but it's possible. So what do I need through the Conservation Commission? Do I need a... Uh, drawing of this nitrogen reduction area or? Well, we can make it a condition of the approval of the deck replacement. Yeah. And then when you submit the final uh, application form, you would include that as part of the plan. So you wouldn't have to come back to us if, if it's a condition, but you wouldn't be able to go ahead without it. Okay, well, if it's a condition and you're requiring it, then we have to do it. Just put that in there and we'll, uh, we'll take care of it. And it might be good to work it into your repertoire as well, if you have a record of putting these things in, because there's going to be increasing demand for them. Okay, we can, we can figure out how to do your system and we'll address it with other homeowners. Okay, anybody else have anything to say? No, I think this is great. I think uh, APC, APCC just uh, designated our harbor as impaired again this year. And anything that we can do, showers, septic, um, we have to do because um, it's just gonna be deteriorating and we have important shellfish and grounds out there. So, um, so I, I would approve the RDA for Parsons with the condition that the um, outdoor rinsing station have a, um, what do you want to call it, Michael? A, well, uh, it's a nitrogen reduction nit nitrogen uh, system underneath the, underneath, where, yeah. where people stand. The Hillary can station. probably, uh, Hillary can probably give you, uh, uh, references to, to plans and so on. Right. All right, if that would that would be nice. Okay, and I, I second, but John, did you have something you wanted to say? I was gonna say exactly what Barbara did. I was gonna recommend we approve this. Okay, motion. all right. But well, I second Barbara's motion. I, yes. So you vote yes, John? Yes. Okay, uh, I vote yes. Benjamin, how do you vote? Yes. Barbara? Yes. And Michael? Yes. Okay. 
That's another one, two. Another two. Hmm. Well, okay, thank you. Good. You're good to go. Thank you. Mm -hmm. All right. Next, we have Miller, 15 weight, 625, map 16, parcel 622, an RDA. Remove damage down trees, brush, and logs. Open walkway from fallen trees, limbs. Excuse me, and cut remaining stumps to grade. Well, we looked all over for this place and didn't find it, but that was just our lack of resources. Oh, John and I found it. Oh, you did? Yeah, we were there. Oh, we didn't take so pictures because we thought you'd be right behind us. Yeah. Well, we were so far behind, we didn't find it. <laughs> you go down Forest Road and make a left. Okay. It's right by Long Pond. Uh huh. Uh huh. Right. Okay. Okay. <laughs> Is there any questions about the specific? Oh, first of all, you saw it. So what did you see? Tell us about it. Uh, we saw a, a number of downed trees uh, and partially, you know, the tops knocked over. What I didn't see was uh, a, a reason to do aggressive um, work. Uh, these trees, there were there's one tree which I could understand you'd want to cut down because because of the potential of a of the tree the top part of the tree was leaning down and could fall over and hurt someone but the other trees were down I didn't see a that there needed to be much work to open up a pathway and I was concerned that these down trees provide habitat for insects and bugs and uh, animals. Um, so I'm, I'm, I just didn't see a reason to do um, as much work as they wanted to do. But Barbara may have a different opinion. Well, is anyone here to represent this? Because uh, we did we did not walk down to the water and they wanted some work down there too, but we didn't have enough time to take the steps down to Long Pond. But we didn't really, there were, there were trees that came down as a result maybe of that hurricane, but they weren't on any structures. They weren't threatening any structures. It just looked like a pretty messy yard in terms of <laughs> the trees that were down. And um, so, I mean, I, I would approve a little bit of cleaning up, but not, and I, I think that's what they're basically proposing, just a little bit of cleaning up, but it's not quite clear to me um, how much really needs to be done, how much is aesthetics and how much is yeah, but it access like, to, the, to the shed. The way they described it though, it sounds like they were only removing the down trees and brush. Well, there are a lot of uh, trees uh -huh. with blue ribbons on them. Oh, yeah. uh, maybe if there's nobody here rep you know, representing, we go back out next time uh, John and I know where it is. So we can take you, <laughs> you there. Can lead us. We can take you there. Okay. Well, since there's nobody here to represent this, why I don't we continue? Can... I vote we continue it to the next meeting. It, which is fine. I just want to say that I was out there. Um, this is one of the ones I can get to too, Barbara, surprisingly, because oh. <laughs> I won't put away 625 anymore. But this is one I've been to and I can get to. And I did take the path all the way down to the water. Um, and there are two trees down there and one is like leaning over the steps down. So I think mm -hmm. it's important that we get you all down there um, to observe that because those two trees down by the water's edge are the most pressing. But I have no idea how in God's name they will haul them out of there because the path is very narrow and tight right. and tricky to navigate. So right. Um, I agree with you. If there's nobody here, we should continue it to our next hearing um, and we should get out there and have a look. Because... I think that's appropriate because it sounds like there's a difference okay. of opinion about what needs to be done. So you move to continue. I second. Uh, John, how do you vote? Yes. I vote yes. Barbara? Yes. Benjamin? Yes. And Michael? Yes. Okay. It's continued until what? Um, three. Uh, what would it be? It'd be about three six. Uh, 
four, no, four. four, six, four, six, four, six. I got the right day, the wrong month. Okay. <laughs> okay. Next, we have Wise, 41 Oaks Way, map 36, parcel 18, and RDA to replace structural supports on second floor deck. We visited this place this morning. Is there somebody to represent this? Unmute yes. yourself, please. There are people. There are people with their hands up. Yes. Hi there. We're the homeowners. We're the homeowners. Okay. I'm Lou, I am Lou Wise, and this is my wife Amy Charney. Hi. And our our builder was supposed to be at the meeting today, but right. we can cover for gonna, him. James Robinson. Well, I'm gonna text him right now. I do see a James's <laughs> iPad oh. present. I don't know. Oh, good. Oh, okay. good. Well, then maybe he is here. James, if that's you, please go ahead and unmute yourself. I think James is not the same James. Uh, James <laughs> Robinson. Oh, there we go. Okay. Okay. I yeah. I'm here. Yeah. Can you see me? Yes. Yep. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, I guess my question was, why did these need to be replaced? They looked like they were pretty substantial, but four of them looked like they were down in the ground. Is that the problem? Yeah, uh, yeah, we're going to replace it because we're going to take, we're going to, um, if you were out there today, where the tape is, mm -hmm. that, 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 main, that main structure there is approximately 10 by 50 feet, um, and it's a 2 by 8 construction. Uh, we're going to change that to 2 by 10 construction, and we're going to um, redo some of the footings there in line with the existing footings they won't be going any 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 further mm -hmm. um uh, into the um uh you know into the buffer zone or anything like that and um and the reason we're doing that is because we want to cantilever it um an additional three feet um and and that's why we have to put in the extra supports for that is there somewhere in the proposal where you talk about the right. expanded size? You mean the extended, the, the uh, yeah. bigger joist size? No, the yeah. extended okay. deck. Extension of the deck. Um, I have to look at the application. Hang on. I, I have it right in front of me. The work description says to replace the structural members of the second floor deck. Yeah. For approximately four to five big foot footings, no increase in footprint of existing structure. Right, so right. There, there will be an increase in right. the cantilevered area. So we, we need to know that too. Okay, so it'll be, it'll be three by, by um, it'll be three by 50. So it's an extra 150 square feet if you, if you count that. Mm -hmm. And what is the total square footage of disturbance on the site? Uh, total square foot is um, is 500 square, well, approximately 500 square feet. No, no, we're talking about the, no, the, no, no. the house, the driveway, any disturbed area on the site? Um, yeah, I'm not sure what you mean. Uh, yeah, what with the new work, you mean? Well, the total uh, disturbed area on the site of the house, uh, all the driveway. decks, driveway, all of that, because there's a limit on how much you can disturb a site. If you mean the, the how much of the site is is has been developed and covered? Yes. 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 Uh, the, I don't know. I don't know exactly, but the the uh, the lot is almost an acre, and it's about an acre and a third. Yeah, yeah. that's that's not. Yeah, that's not the issue for us. The issue is there's a maximum amount of disturbed area oh. on the site is possible. No, I know that, but we, we are not increasing the amount of disturbed site. You just said it's extended 150 square feet. Well, we're not well, disturbing, it, we're not we're not disturbing the any portion of the ground to do that. No, but it is affecting the drainage. It's yeah. affecting the buffer zone. Light. Yeah, the amount of light that hits ground. Uh, how, it, it, how, need, it needs to be on the plan that we're approving. Yeah. We need to approve what we're gonna, what's gonna actually happen. We're not saying we won't approve it, but we're no, just saying that it has to be on your plan. It, it is on the plan. It's my understanding that it's yeah. 
plan that was submitted to the building official, building there, inspector. There's no mention of a cantilevered deck, expansion of the deck um, it's on, the shown plan. on the plan, though, ma'am. Yeah, I'm, I'm looking and I don't see it. It's not I'm shown also... on the plan that we have before us as the Conservation Commission. So we have um, <laughs> an old site plan from January 10th, 2002 that has a uh, square box that says proposed work area that shows an upper level deck. And then we have a host of photographs of the site. And then we have the deck. another plan that shows proposed area of work circled on an assessor's data sheet. And then we have the text that I read that says no increase in footprint of existing structures. So the Conservation Commission does not get the application that the building department gets. Ah, okay. Uh, I have uh, another question, if I may. Yeah, go ahead. So uh, we were out there, uh, I hope you can see it. There's this drainage pipe that comes out and goes right into the wetlands. What is what is that? A drainage pipe attaches to the uh, the gutter. Yeah. So you're taking directly from the gutter, into right channeled in off toward the wetland, rather than into a dry well. Yeah. That's yes. Too. Well, it, it, since it's in it's in the ACEC, you really have to put it into a dry well. Well, okay. Uh, before the, before the pipe was put there, it was just draining, you know, on the ground and and gul making a gully. Yeah, but directing yeah. it closer to the wetland is not the solution. <laughs> True. Well, that's where that's where it was headed. <laughs> well, no. that's what our builder. That's did, I mean, that's so uh, your builder. Been a decision we made. Well, I understand that, but if you're going to be extending the, the height of the deck, of the width of the deck, you should really deal with this runoff from the gutters, not by just directing it toward the wetlands. Right. Putting in a dry, a dry well for it. It's uh, not a major thing, but it makes a difference in terms of the water seeping toward the wetland. I'm sure you want to preserve your view in the wetlands. Of course. Yeah. Of course. So that would be, in, as far as I'm concerned, the condition is dealing with that, yeah. with that runoff. That's not a good thing. There's also a question. There is on the on the uh, the site when we went out there. There's a big pile of new stair equipment, you know, stair uh, treads and and uh, risers. Are you going to be replacing the stairwell? And there's one that stairwell on each side of the house. Yes, that's yes, our intention. That's part of it, yes. Yes, we're going to replace some of the stringers there, yeah. So is that going to be touching the ground? Because it's not in the application. No, because they have a, uh, they have a separate um, uh, platform underneath each staircase. They're kind of covered with their leaves at the moment, but we're yeah. going to be, but, you know, we're going to be using that. All right because mm -hmm. that would be something that it's not mentioned. And so there's no way to know how you were going to handle other than the fact that it's clearly something was going to be done. All right. So, right, so, is there, so, so could I amend this? So could I amend this tomorrow and get that into you with the, um, with the um, extra 150 square feet? Well, we need, what we need is the calculated total square feet before and after the, Plus the plan with the with the correct uh, dimensions of the new deck. Well, they have that. We don't have that, but they evidently have it someplace else, right? But we need to see we need to see the location on the site plan. So we have to um, have a proper copy, an accurate copy for the record. So in short, the answer is yes. You can drop off more papers tomorrow, and we would get you back on an agenda for April sixth. <coughs> Oh, okay. Unfortunately, that's the next time we meet. So what about the, what about all this uh, drive? So let me just write this down. What about all this driveway? And, and um, so it's just the it's just the deck you want, the square footage of the addition well, of the deck. It, it's, it's the amount of disturbance in the in the 
hundred foot buffer zone. So hundred feet of, of air of the area that we are um, supposed to pr to protect and have jurisdiction over. We want to know how much of that is covered by structure and disturbance. Well, that that should be on to the two thousand two approved plan. Uh, nothing has changed except for adding uh, the yeah. slope to the deck. But well, the good, the, exactly. good news seems to, the good news seems to be that the 100 foot line goes right to the middle of the house, which means the driveway and all of that is outside of our jurisdiction, right? Is anybody else seeing this or is it just me? I'm, I'm seeing the 100 near the top, right below the uh, where yeah, the, I see it. Yep, there's 100 feet and it goes basically right to the house, but the driveway and all that stuff is, that disturbance is outside of our jurisdiction. That's correct. All right, yep. All right. So, so just, really, just, just, yeah. So, so is, so is uh, the stairs. Well, maybe, maybe not. Okay, all right. So yeah. it's just, um, it's just to have on the record. We, we just need it for the record. It's part yeah. of our environmental bylaws that this be in every filing. It's also part of the filing instructions. Right. So it is clearly depicted in right. the filing instructions. Um, but it is just the, I mean, the data is on the approved plan. So. Except it's not, it's not spelled out in, in a dimensional capacity that's clear to the commission. So it should show us the amount of disturbance uh, within the zero to 50, which appears to be none. Actually, there's a very tiny. Yeah. Corner portion. Oh yeah, yeah. We're, yeah. we're not. We're not uh, going anywhere near that uh, that uh, corner there. We're, mm -hmm. we're 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 you know we're um, away from that from mm -hmm. that corner that you're talking about on but, the but on the need, on the fifty foot line. But you need to calculate. You need to calculate the total area of disturbance by looking at those and, and getting the square feet dimensions and okay. adding them up and showing them on the plan. Yeah. So we clearly, you'll have to. You'll have to. Uh, approximate what's going through the house. It's a curve right. line right through your house. Right. But it looks like you're going to be in good shape anyway. Half of your house and then all your driveway are outside of our jurisdiction. So when you say in good shape, what is the standard that we're uh, looking at? I'm not sure what 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 purpose that serves. I'm just you curious. can't exceed five thousand square feet of disturbance. Yeah. Yeah. Which includes the house yeah. and any other structure in, yeah. in the, the in driveway, the, anything in, in, the, in, the, in the buffer zone, the not on your property, just in the protected area. The hundred foot area, right? Yeah. Right. right. Yes. So we're so we're way under that then, right? Yeah. Way, I mean, way, way, way under. Way under. Right. Right. Okay. Yeah. All right. Yeah. I mean the whole. Okay. Like I, that's why I said you're in good shape. Right. You just need to get the the details down on it. We need the updated plan we, and the updated, uh, there'll be an updated uh, uh, site plan. Yeah. And, and we need that uh, information on That's and it. The, now, and now, the, now, 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 when you say updated, oh, sorry, when you say updated site plan, you're not talking about having like an as built plan, are you? Uh, pardon me. Uh, I, I said when you said like an updated plan, are you talking about having a, like a, a new as built done? Uh, yeah, essentially. I mean, yes, you're, you're going to have this plan. Right. And, and you'll have the additions to the deck that you're doing. Right. And you'll say, currently, we have this much uh, okay. disturbance within the 100 foot, and afterwards, we'll have this much. Oh, okay. All right. Okay. okay. Yeah. 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 But I plus, think it, you're going to be fine. It's okay. Plus, plus, I would, I would recommend strongly. Uh, uh, planned for the the drainage into right. dry wells. Right, right, right. Well, really not a big deal. When is the plan the, is the plan that's been submitted to the building official what you're looking for, or something more formal than that? The the building we, department probably doesn't have plans for dry wells. No, no, no. For just the dry wells, I'm talking about the the uh, updated the the construct the, construct, the site yeah. plan. The, you know the uh, a site plan. Yeah, the plan of the, because the, the, members official, of the, the official uh, definition of what your property is has and what it's getting taxed, right? 
Uh, when is the when is the deadline for the for these uh, new pa uh, plans to be submitted before the April sixth meeting? The, the Wednesday before. The Wednesday before. Okay. Well, I'll get those in. Okay. Great. All right. So I move that we continue this until April sixth, where we'll have updated information and we'll be able to make an informed decision. Second, Barbara. Second. All right, John. How do you vote? Uh, continue. Yes. Yeah. Uh, I vote yes, Barbara. Yes. Benjamin. Yes. And Michael. Yes. Okay. You're going to be in good shape. Don't worry. We just need to get everything. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Yeah. Thanks a lot. Thank you. All right. Next, we have Buttery Way. L L C. Hello. 20 Buttery Way, Map 16, Parcel 627, RDA, septic upgrade. It's actually 200, Liam. I'm sorry. It's 200 yes. Buttery Way. Sorry. Yes. Hello. 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 For the record, um, Laura Schofield here from Schofield Brothers, um, representing the property owners. Uh, this is a septic system upgrade for a four bedroom house um, located at 200 Buttery Way. This is a 5.8 acre property that overlooks Great Pond. Um, the house was built in 1925 originally, I believe. Um, and this existing septic system is getting tired and the property owners would like to replace it. So right now, um, the house is served by a single, uh, I'm sorry, a septic tank and a leach pit. Um, the septic tank is inside of the buffer zone to Great Pond. Um, in terms of wetland resource areas, we have Great Pond to the south. Uh, there's a little bit of a fringe of BVW associated with the pond, and then we have an inland bank as the edge of Great Pond, and then the 100-foot buffer associated with that resource area that overlaps um, a good portion of the property around the house. The entire house and uh, part of the driveway right now are within that buffer zone, the Great Pond. And across the street, we also have a bordering vegetated wetland system that is associated with Great Pond. So you have a 100 foot buffer zone coming the other direction from the bordering vegetated wetland across the street. Um, in terms of site constraints, when you're trying to upgrade the septic system, we also have the two private wells that serve the locust property and the property next door to the north. Um, so I was questioning what this upgrade was going to look like, but at the end of the day, it really um, worked out well. We had one little triangular piece of land um, to try and fit in a full-size Title V um, system to serve the existing house outside of both buffer zones, outside of the 100-foot well setbacks to both of the private wells, and we've managed to just squeeze it in there. Um, we do require a pump chamber so that we can provide the um, required uh, vertical setback distance to the high groundwater elevation. So we're gonna end up with a septic tank, pump chamber, full-size leaching area. All of the components to the septic system, the new septic system will be outside of uh, the buffer zone. So the only work that's going to be inside the buffer zone is um, connecting the house to the new septic tank with the building sewer, and also to pump out um, the existing septic tank and rupture it and fill it. And we also need to shift the driveway over a little bit um, because we, don't, we can't be driving on top of this particular leaching area. Um, we are calling for a erosion control and silt fence barrier on the plan. I'm not worried about um, erosion um, being an issue to Great Pond because there's quite a ridge there that separates where the work is going on and the pond itself. 
but just to provide adjacent woodland areas from um, construction encroaching into those areas. We've called for the erosion control. Um, so that's pretty much it in terms of the septic system. I'm happy to answer any questions the commission has. Um, I just also wanted to point out that this is in um, natural heritage territory. And most of the time, a septic system upgrade would be exempt from that if you're from um, their review, if you were putting the septic system within an existing lawn area, but there are no lawn areas at this property. The woodland is everywhere that the house and the driveway is not. So um, <laughs> it's a very natural site. And most of the um, 5.8 acres is existing woodland. So that was the other nice thing that worked out with the placement of the leaching area is that it's right in between the house and the existing driveway. So we can really keep the um, footprint of human activity limited to that little spot on the lot. So that's it, and I'm happy to answer any questions. Okay, anybody have any questions? Yes, Leon. Uh, Go ahead, Michael. So in your uh, proposal, you say that there is some clearance required to install a septic system and grading. Do you have a sense of what sum is in terms of square feet? Um, in terms of square feet, the footprint, let me do some quick math here, but most of the clearing, well, I should, really all of the clearing that's required for this is outside of the buffer zone. Um, but you're looking at like approximately a well, if Well, if it's outside of the buffer zone, then that's, that's fine. It just it was a little bit vague in your proposal. The other question, and I'm sure a number of commissioners have this, is why aren't you installing an uh, advanced system, an IA system? Well, in this case, as I mentioned, the property is a 5.8 acre uh, property. So in terms of nitrogen loading, um, there's enough lot area for 25 bedrooms here. And also it fronts on the pond. So I think here um, phosphorus is the issue rather than um, nitrogen because we have such a large lot area. Um, that's not um, a concern in this case. Um, it's also simply replacing what's there um, with a fully complying Title V septic system. Um, and the Wetlands Protection Act does state that if you have a fully compliant Title V septic system, you are protecting um, the interests of the Wetlands Protection Act. Well, I'm not saying that it's, le it's legally required. I'm, I'm asking why the owners didn't decide to enhance the uh, nitrogen absorption, which eventually will reach the pond. I mean, it is a very fragile site. Uh, with the freshwater wetland, I think phosphorus is more of the issue, the limiting nutrient in a freshwater system. Yes, uh, that's true. That's true. But nitrogen also is a factor. Well, and again, because the lot is so large, um, that's why we, we weren't considering it here. Uh, well, and also, I should also point out that the house is very seasonally and minimally used. So that was another reason for not um, looking at that in this scenario. It may not always be, I mean, the mm -hmm. septic system is there for a while, it may not always be uh, uh, lightly used. And you know, there is a there is a subsidy from the town for putting in an IA system. Yep, that is true. And I think that if the property owners ever decided to to um, live in Wellfleet on a more permanent basis, that this design does lend itself <laughs> for potentially in the future being able to plug something like that in. So I don't think that they're, you know, necessarily against it forever, but at this point in time, we're just looking at having a conventional system here, which, which right now, I suspect that the leaching pit that is there now is probably either in or close to the groundwater. So this 
definitely will be a big improvement over over what's there now. Okay, and your justification for that doesn't make sense. Uh, Leon, you're you're breaking up a bit. I'm sorry, I was holding up a piece of paper. That seemed like a a, a reasonable uh, explanation of why you made the decisions you're making. Uh, we do have if. <laughs> It may be that in the future, if that property uh, transfers to someone else, that'll be required, but right now it's not. So, uh, but it will be a big improvement on what's going on now. So, anybody like to make a motion? Okay, I'll move that we approve the RDA for Buttery Way LLC 200 Buttery Way Map 16 Parcel 627. I second. All right, John. Can you come back to me? <laughs> uh, uh -huh. Barbara. Yes. Benjamin. Yes. Michael. Yes. And Leon. Yes. Okay. Uh, good. Yes, okay, so that's four now, zero. Wait, so this is a minus three? It's a negative three, yes. And I, I just want to add in, um, when we think about nitrogen and nitrogen loading, <clears throat> we do take into account the lot size. And the general rule of, of thumb is 10,000 square feet of land um, <clears throat> for one bedroom. So this parcel is one of the unique ones in town that is actually five acres with only four bedrooms on it. So it's not currently upside down as far as the nitrogen loading goes. So, so I, I would agree with Laura's assessment that, that a nitrogen reducing system, while they're good and I support them and they reduce nitrogen, it truly wouldn't be warranted at, at this site based on the size of the lot and the location of the system. Hillary, can I just say, I'm, my reason for abstaining was actually because phosphates i just yes yes I'm concerned about the fact that this person is investing a great deal of money to upgrade a system which is not going to to deal with the central problem that faces our ponds which is phosphates yeah now, correct and i, I think about it, that so i'm not voting against it yeah but i, I, I understand and i'm not upset or angry or or anything but this may be one <laughs> site if the homeowner decides to live here full time that they have a look at the phosphate removing systems that we talked about um, in the business meeting. So, so just options and food for thought for the future for Lara and the homeowner. Okay. So you're good to go. We're done. Okay, Laura. Thank you. All right. Next one is Quickman, 53 Chiquisset Bluff Road, map 20, parcel 39, RDA septic upgrade. Is there somebody here to represent that? Me again. <laughs> oh, okay. Geez, I thought we got rid of you, huh? No. Nope. <laughs> <laughs> Can't get rid of me that easy. <laughs> okay. Um, right. So this is another straight septic system upgrade. Um, this is a property, um, as you just mentioned, at uh, 53 Chiquesset Bluff Road, overlooks the harbor. Um, this is a 20,000 square foot lot. There's an existing six bedroom house on the lot, and then there's an existing um, one bedroom accessory dwelling unit. So in terms of resource areas, um, we have the harbor. This um, property has a bulkhead um, on the landward side of the beach. We have a coastal bank. We have a uh, land subject coastal storm flowage that hits the face of the bank. Um, and then we have the Wellfleet uh, 50 foot filter strip once you get um, from back from the top of the bank. Um, we have the limit of the Wellfleet Harbor ACEC. And then we have the 100 foot uh, buffer zone to um, the top of the coastal bank. So, um, this, this is a large system. It's a seven bedroom system. 
Right now, the house and the accessory dwelling unit are served by a septic tank and a single leach pit. Uh, I believe the age of the system is 30 plus years old, so it's getting tired. And the homeowner uh, who's here with us, Mr. Whitman, uh, is looking at replacing the system. So again, you know, we have private wells that we need to look at uh, maintaining the setback to the private wells. And we also have to try and maximize our distance to the um, adjacent coastal wetland resource areas. Um, what we have proposed here is a 2,500 gallon two compartment septic tank um, a leading to a distribution box and again leading to a full size Title V leaching area for a seven bedroom system. Um, we managed to keep 100 feet from all the private wells with the leaching area and I managed to keep half of it out of the buffer zone to uh, the top of the coastal bank. We are over 100 feet from um, the edge of the harbor. Um, and again, it's just the, um, the edge of the leaching area that falls within your jurisdiction, uh, which is why we're here. Um, in terms of protecting the coastal bank, um, this system is proposed to go underneath the driveway <laughs> and the slope of the land um, from where the driveway is slopes up towards the coast of the coastal bank. So I have a limit of work proposed again, just to rein in construction. Um, but I'm not worried about the work impacting the, the stability of the coastal bank. Um, so we do need to um, revise an existing retaining wall in order to provide the proper grading over the leaching area. Um, that occurs uh, near the garden, if you can see that on the plan. So that retaining wall is gonna be bumped out a little bit uh, so that we can provide the, the grading over the leaching area. Um, that's pretty much it. I'm happy to answer any questions um, that the commission has. Leon, may I ask two questions? Go ahead, Michael. One, one relatively simple. If you've been listening, you know that we have to have the total disturbed area on the plan, and I don't see it. Perhaps I'm missing it. Is it there I, in summer? I did not do, um, I mean, it's represented on the plan, but I did not um, do the math to, to spell out the square footage in the in the buffer zone. Because in this case, uh, given the size of the main house, it may be an issue. It, except the only thing that's being proposed, Michael, is a septic system which is underground. Right. That's that's true, but it still should be on the plan somewhere. For sure. It, it, yeah, that can be a condition. And I can this, certainly I can certainly add that later. I should have mentioned that the septic system is um, proposed within areas that are already either driveway or lawn or in between the two houses. So there's no um, clearing the of natural areas to construct the new system. Right, and the retaining wall is not sufficiently disturbing. So that's probably not an issue. The other question is, uh, again, it's you don't make comparisons to other projects, but is there a reason that you're not using an advanced system here, given that it's seven bedrooms uh, and part of it is within the 100 foot? So when I sat down to design the system, I thought that I was going to be within a well um, setback or I was going to be within 100 feet of Wellfleet Harbor. And I managed to design this thing so it wasn't because in Wellfleet, those are the two trigger points for having the enhanced technology. And I know that the town has money available to help home, homeowners with the initial um, purchase of this technology. Um, for homeowners, that cost goes 
on and on basically forever in the operation and maintenance agreements that they're required to have the electrical costs and the and the testing and because of that cost um you know that's scary to a lot of homeowners to have to accept that that burden um forever basically and shoulder it alone um so for my clients if i don't trigger something that requires them to have something that's that expensive and if i can design something that doesn't trigger any automatic um, requirements for them to have the enhanced treatment that's usually the road that we end up going because at this point it is up to the homeowner to to pay for it and in this case um i know a seven bedroom it is a small lot it is right on wellfleet harbor i think in this case you've got a, a historic seven bedroom home that i do not believe is packed to capacity um all the time so the actual it's tricky when you get into how the property is actually used versus what the design code says you're using it for. So I, I don't know if that well, answers. You're just, you're, it's frustrating because your justification for the last one not using <laughs> IA is because it was such a big lot. Well, this is a little tiny lot with a huge yep. house on it, and it's right on the bay. Those are not good things. So I mean. You can't, you can't get it both ways. I'm sorry. Well, you, I was asked why we didn't yeah, no, put I, it right off the bat. No, and that, yeah, that's why. That's a good question. And it's a good yeah. answer. But it just seems a little frustrating that this is a diametric opposite of, of the last one that we talked about. And yet, it seems OK to you. I mean, uh, well, any other questions? John, I've got a question. Yes, I have to quote once again Aldo Leopold, who said, ethical behavior is doing the right thing, even when it's not legally required. And it seems to me that the ethical behavior in this case is to put in the advanced IA system, because although it is an expense to the homeowner, we're talking about the impact on a resource, the bay, which provides employment for shellfishing and ultimately for the whole community. And our bays are at risk. The uh, APCC report just came out and pointed out the fact that our bays are at risk, uh, for, particularly for nitrogen, well, for nitrogen overload. So you have an opportunity here to do something about a crisis that faces our whole town of which the people who own this house uh, are part of um, and saying, well, it's an added expense for the homeowner um, seems to me a rather um, limited response. And I go back to Aldo Leopold and I'm, I'm, I'm sad that that's the response that the homeowner is taking. This is an expense for me. so. You know, I don't care about what it means for the whole town. I don't think that people answer. don't care. I just, it's a reality of those systems. And I don't know if there's any mechanism for towns to come up with to maybe think of a way to alleviate um, that burden for people who end up, um, you know, needing to put these these systems in. And living in this town. Could I go ahead? Go ahead. Yes, we care deeply about the environment um, for decades. And um, that's what precipitated, even though our system is functioning and healthy, that's what precipitated being proactive in replacing it with a, a new contemporary, uh, totally new design system. I just asked the question, will it do the job? You know, we don't want to and um, it won't. It will not remove the nitrates. It will not remove nitrates from our bay. It only removes the bacteria. Right. So if you were concerned about the nitrates in the bay, which we are and should be, then this system makes no difference for that. I see. OK. OK. So a new conventional system would not, but an IA system would. 
Correct. Right. And th this is Barbara. I, I agree with what's been said. This seems to be like a poster child for a situation where you can actually have an impact on the har on the harbor and the shell fishing. In a very direct um, way. Yes. Well, it does make a lot of sense, and 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 you're right. Um, I was under the. I thought that a brand new system, just replacing what mm -hmm. we had, would would, be, would would do the job. Well, it would be an improvement on what you have, but it wouldn't do the job that I think we'd like to see in terms of the resource areas we're trying to protect and the shell fishing resource we're trying to protect. Is there a quantitative? You obviously care about as well. Absolutely. I mean, I, I absolutely, I, we don't need to go into each other's backgrounds and history, but um, what quantitative effect would it be? I mean, is it analogous to someone who owns a, and again, as a layperson, is analogous to someone who owns a, a, a large truck but only drives it once a month to carry lumber or versus someone who owns a Prius who drives it every day, every day, every day, every day. Every day. Um, you know what I'm saying? Um, yeah, well, yeah, I mean. Quantitative difference would it be between the IA system and a brand new system? A lot, as far as nitrogen goes. Yeah, in terms of nitrogen. Right out of the day, the nitrogen will go right out of the day. And that's what causes the algae blooms and all the problems that we're having. Not the algae blooms. But. And Hillary can probably tell you what percentage of the nitrogen comes out from a standard Title VI as opposed to an advanced. So, Hillary, can you do that? So the um, standard Title V removes no nitrogen at all, very little. And a IA system gets you down to 19 milligrams per liter. Um, the enhanced IAs are reporting to get down to between five and 10 milligrams per liter. So the enhanced IAs like we've talked about are not under general use approval yet. So there's some slight risk associated with those, but the standard IA systems, um, we've used them for many, many years are performing better now than they have been in the past. So, um, they remove your nitrogen down to 19 milligrams per liter. Um, and if they're not, your service provider can come in and tweak them so that they perform better. So there is um, a marked difference between a Title V and an IA, and then again versus the enhanced IA. Uh, one more point, I think you should be aware, because I don't want you to feel like we're snookering you about something, that the crisis in the Bay is such that the town may have to go to sewering a large part of the town, and you might be in the area that gets sewered by the town. And a, a, a sewered system does remove significant amounts of nitrates. That would cure the problem. Um, so that's also possible that 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 you know that the town has to sewer, and your area still may be in the area they sewer. So, you know, and that was, this has been a three year conversation with us with doing as much research as we can as lay people with the foot with the, dealing with the issues and caring about the issues that you're talking about. Right. There's always, there are always real, real and imagined fears mm -hmm. and not as, as sensitive as we are to the environment. Not everyone can rush out and spend thousands more a year on all the various right. things that we that we're told we have to have. Um, so what about the option? that Laura referred to before of being able to plug in an IA system later. If we upgrade the system we've got, that is better than what we've got, it's working now. Um, and with the idea of going either way, going to a sewage later, that was an early question we had. I think I asked Hillary, are we, why should we, if we're gonna go to a sewage system, why bother to replace the septic system? Mm -hmm. So if we replaced it with a conventional system that that's designed so we could plug in an IA, then see what goes on with the sewage system, then mm -hmm. we'd have the option to go ahead and enhance it with an IA a little bit later. Well, that's the future, but... I'm guessing that then begs the question on whether you withdraw the application and continue operating on your old Title V 
until you actually have the need to do something and see where we are um, in the regulation world when that happens. Well, if, just, uh, if you have some insight as to when a sewage, sewage I hate to, you know, it, it will, for some people they just write the check. For us, it's gonna be a struggle to do this either way. So why, when you mention a sewer system, if it's gonna happen in two years, we can chug along. I, I don't yeah. think it's going to happen as soon as two years because we would still have to design and permit. Uh, we have to still agree on a comprehensive plan. Um, two years is not reasonable. Uh, I would be looking maybe to the five to 10 year mark for a sewage treatment plant, um, a sewering option, but a regulation to install IA, I mean, that that could happen in the short term or the enhanced IA. So I, you know, it it's sort of none of us are holding that crystal ball. The Board of Health can decide, you know, they're going to talk about this at their next meeting, which you heard at our last meeting. Um, they're going to talk about some policies and new regulations. So I don't know what that looks like yet because they're a board of five. Uh, the Conservation Commission obviously feels very strongly about the installation of IA and enhanced IA because they believe in it and think that it works to protect the harbor. So, um, and the comprehensive plan is being worked on as we speak as well, which would, you know, require certain things go on around town. But none of us are holding the crystal ball today to tell you when exactly that will happen. Is this one of the areas that would be slated for sewage um, right along Mayo Beach here? It's a little bit outside of the downtown, so. Yeah. That's the other issue, we don't know. Might not even be included yeah. right. in the sewage system, right? Ever, yeah, I see. But I just wanted you to be aware of that possibility. Thank you, I appreciate that. And I just wanted I just wanted to go back to one thing real quick if you're a numbers guy. Um, a Title V, uh, the nitrogen loads coming out of um, a Title V are anywhere between 26 and 42 milligrams per liter. And then the IA systems can get to 19. Some are performing better. And the enhanced IAs are between 5 and 10. And should anybody on the call have a cesspool, those are between 45 and 65 milligrams per liter. So those are the numbers that we're working with. So it doesn't sound, uh, maybe I missed something. It doesn't sound like the conventional system that we're talking about is that much different than the straight IA system. Am I wrong? Well, it's 50% less. It, I mean, the standard yeah. nitrogen coming out of a Title V is 26 to 42 milligrams per liter. Right, and if this is a seven bedroom house on a small lot, it, it really compounds the issues quite a bit. Sure, although how much does the use, as Laura mentioned, these properties don't get used 10 months out of the year. Except what we build has to be, um, we build for year round occupancy and full use. I mean, you, you know, because yeah, I mean, we can't, we can't, yeah. We never know when a property is going to transfer or be utilized to its utmost capacity. So, and is the new uh, auxiliary uh, auxiliary building going to be used full time? Well, it's like a, it's an it's a, a master bedroom suite that's just detached because that seems sexier to do than try to expand the house because the house is an historic structure and and uh, we it was a twenty year. Uh, project to bring it back to its stateful historic reconstruction and we wanted to keep it original. So it's just a, a uh, you know, a, a small bedroom. But it's an auxiliary dwelling unit. Yeah, it's just a bedroom, a bedroom, but mm. not attached to the house, just detached. Mm. Just a mother-in-law bedroom. I don't know what to tell you to do. Um, I think you're in a difficult spot, and I'm sympathetic to that. But you see where what our our oh, I, I absolutely do. Yeah, I, and um, you know, there are some folks in town who have vast amounts of money, and no fault to them. And other people are have a social security check, and and that's already, you know, gone. So um, so, um, well, it sounds like we should 
turn it into an IA system doesn't sound like you're going to, you're going to prove a convection with the system um, and just make it work. Yeah, this is, uh, yeah, I'd like you to explore what the, you know, what, what we can help you, or it's possible the town can help you with, with the cost of the installation. We have a subsidy. Yes, we're aware of that. It's a lot like having having twins. The the yeah. getting, having them is is not the problem. Um, yeah, it's well, ongoing. Um, you know, they get into college, and it's not going to just be two hundred dollars a month. It's going to be more and more and more and more and more and more. Well, I think it it would be good to know what the specifics are as far as um, with your projected usage. What would be the cost of your of a uh, maintenance program for it. You know, that's where using it two months out of the year might make a difference. Yeah. Well, um, I think if we just, um, if we go with an IA and then try to make it work, then um, can that be passed today? I would maybe a little toward. Yeah. If that's a condition, we can do that. If or Laura, do think, Laura can adapt. Laura, that. can you adapt your design for an IA with the, all the constraints that you have? Um, I'm sure I can squeeze it in there. It'll be outside of the buffer zone. So mm -hmm. if you approve it tonight with the condition that an IA is included, it mm -hmm. wouldn't change anything inside your jurisdiction. OK. Other than treated effluent, I, I I will propose that we accept this on that condition and and really appreciate the fact that the homeowner wants to work with us on this. I think yeah. that shows the right spirit, and we should encourage it. Yeah. Second, Michael. John, how do you vote? Yes. I vote yes. Barbara. Yes. Benjamin. Yes. And Michael. Yes. So you have permission to do this. If you find that the IA is just totally prohibitive as far as maintenance and you can't do it, well, then you'll have to come back to us with a modify and we'll deal with it then. But, right. thank, thank you. Thanks for the clear understanding. I appreciate it. Yeah, it's, it's important. And you're, you're a big house right on the edge. So it, it can't get any more needed than where you're at. The bay is more important than any one of us, and it's important for yeah, our descendants. So, so, yeah. Okay, well, thank you, sir. And thank you for your being considerate. Not all homeowners are as sympathetic to these issues as you are. So I appreciate that. It's a beautiful house and a beautiful place. We do have things here, but um, I know you all do too. So, okay. And it's a negative three, correct? Correct. And it's a. Uh... It's just the form too, right? <laughs> okay, well, that, that's great. Um, I was really concerned about that particular situation. Okay, great. Thank you, sir. Mr. Whitman, appreciate okay. it. Thank you all very much. Enjoy. Let me turn on the light here. Okay. Last on our list is Elson, 10 D Street, Map 40, Parcel 2, NOI, Construction Edition. We went and visited that today. Um, is there somebody, Mr. Little, are you representing this or? Good, e good evening, everyone. David Little, can you hear me okay? Yes, yeah. we can. Okay. So, I, I see that Richard Elson is attending the Zoom meeting as well. Um, <clears throat> so 10 D Street is a developed property on Lieutenant's Island. Approximately 16% of the lot has been developed. And the majority of the site is located within land subject to coastal storm flowage. Um, Richard and his wife occupy a very small footprint on their property on Lieutenant Island. As you could see during the during your site visit, uh, almost the entire site, with the exception of the driveway and the area around the house, has been, has been left natural. 
And what we are proposing to do is to construct a 12 by 14 foot addition under an existing 14 by 16 foot deck. The work would occur over a previously altered area that now consists of an outdoor gravel storage area. The addition will be constructed on a crawl space foundation and in accordance with FEMA requirements that because we're in a flood zone, we are gonna have to provide openings within the crawl space foundation in the event of a flood event to allow floodwaters to enter and exit, which we, which we intend to do. And then the existing deck will be rebuilt on top of the addition to match the future footprint. What, what is happening here is approximately a 66 square foot reduction in the deck. So uh, while there will be an impervious surface created on the site, uh, the actual structure will be reduced slightly. On the plan, if, if, you can, if you've had a chance to look at it, the 100 year flood zone and coastal bank on the east side of the property extends up and we've shown the 50 foot flood 50 foot buffer zone and 100 foot buffer zone to it, as well as the approximate ACEC boundary. And all the work is outside of that, but the work is occurring within land subject to coastal storm flowage. And that's why I filed a notice of intent. Mm -hmm. uh, the, we, we marked out the limit of work. We also marked out the extent of the proposed work under the existing deck. And um, we've added a construction note that any excess excavated material would be removed from the site. And that also gutters and downspouts would be connected to dry wells or crushed stone at the roof drip line. Um, I, all I can say is that I think that the Elsons have uh, they, it, as I said at the onset, they, on, they occupy a very small footprint on this property and I'm, I'm hopeful that this would be a project that could be conditioned by the commission. Mm -hmm. um, we did mark out the limit of work. We, there is a small area of um, bearberry that might be disturbed during construction, but other than that, I think there would be little or no disturbance to the site and I would open myself up to questions. Thank you very much. We visited this site and uh, does anybody on the commission have any questions or statements? I do have a, a small question. Okay. Uh, Go ahead, Michael. There is a strange tree growing on exactly where you're <laughs> going to put this. You're... Uh, you're going to have to remove that, presumably. Well, I, you know, I expected that someone would bring this up, Mr. Fisher, and um, if if you would like another tree to be planted to replace the one that will have to be removed as a result of the construction, we would be happy to a good a condition to that extent. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. I, that would be a good idea. I think. Uh, any other questions? I think that this looks like a, a, a net gain generally. They get more living space and a little bit more sun hits the ground and a little less cover. And it is pretty much outside of our area of, of concern, isn't it? Except for the flood zone. Except for the flood zone, which is your well, whole given, house. Given the, um, given the, uh, amount of discussion that's gone on with RDAs this evening. I'm kind of glad I submitted an NOI. That's <laughs> yeah, just the nature of it. And you're well prepared for it too. Uh, am I seeing, I want to get back to the bugaboo of, uh, the, well, there isn't actually. Can I just make one comment back to David on that? Absolutely. David, I, I think that the difference also is who's representing the applicant. When you hire uh, a competent, consultant with permitting experience, you get mm -hmm. a much better put together application and you can engage in a conversation relative to the regulations 
and the application before you. But what we're seeing in this big building boom is we're getting a lot of builders making applications and land. Not, I don't landscapers or or the folks that actually cut the trees making the application, and they're not as savvy with the regulation work. So it's um, it, it's it's easier to contemplate a well put together application that gives us everything we need to make a a, a good educated decision. Right, well, and an well, NOI was appropriate here. Well, and I, well, I think- well, Thank that, you very much, but I, I do have to defer to Richard Elson and his wife, who obviously occupy a very small footprint on their property on Lieutenant's Island. So um, this is Barbara and I move that we approve the NOI for Elson. Second, John Cumbler. Okay, great. John, how do you vote? Yes. I vote yes. Barbara? Yes. Benjamin? Yes. <clears throat> Michael? Well, the Wellfleet Conservation Trust is an abutter, so I will recuse. Okay. No problem. We got it. We have, we accept it. So this is approved. Four and five. Four and five. five. Yeah. And we need a supervisor because it's an NOI. Oh. Nobody's raising their hands. Okay, I'll do That's because it. it's Lieutenant's Island. We can That's just right. I, I know. No, I'll, I'll just go out there in my kayak. All right, we'll take it. All right. <laughs> You're going to take it, Hillary? We'll take That's it. I know you guys don't said. like driving Thank over you. here. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank You're you. Welcome. Good luck, Mr. Elson. Um, before we leave, I just want to thank everybody on the committee for doing a great job tonight, I thought, given some tough things. I thought we had a great discussion and it was positive and I appreciate everyone's patience with these issues. Well, they're all important, John. All important. Otherwise we're wasting our time. <laughs> <laughs> they're all important and we're making a difference one property at a time, albeit slow, um, <laughs> we'll, we'll have an yeah. impact, so. Yeah. Okay, I move that we adjourn. Second, so, Michael. All right, John, how do you vote? Yes. Yes. Uh, vote yes. Barbara? Yes. Benjamin? Yes. And Michael? Yes. We're done. Christine, Thank you, Leon. Thank, Thank you, Leon. It, it, it was great team effort. Thank you. Good job. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.